सुदर्शन मंडल इज प्रेजेंटिंग समथिंग यार स्टॉप डॉक्टर गोलम होशेल मोहम्मद गोलम होशेल सर आर यू वेलकम सर ओके थैंक यू गुड आफ्टरनून वेरी शॉर्टली वी शुड स्टार्ट दिस वेबिनार Deep uh, speaker, another one, or I am the first speaker. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a professor Oru Pratham Bandhu Batai in session okay. one, and another one is Mamad uh, Gola Mushrins. Okay, thank you. Okay, and you. this session will be chaired by the professor Shubhit Mishra. Okay, uh, with the permission of the chairman, Professor Dr. Deva Prasad Sabu. another chairman professor dr deepak kumar punia and organizing secretary and convener mrs ruby adat panda the joint convener dr arup majumdar the joint secretary of this webinar dr shantanu panda sir i like to start the second day program of Three days international webinar on anthropology of epidemics, which is organized by Department of Anthropology and IQAC of Shiva Bharati Mahavidyalaya in collaboration with the Department of Anthropology, Shukumar Sen Gupta Mahavidyalaya, Keshpu. I like to start the sessions with the speech of Ruth Benedict. She told that. The purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences. Not only that, Nancy Bates Smith also told that anthropology is the science which tells us that people are the same the whole world over except when they are different. Today, 29th October, Friday, we are going to start the second day. webinar of international webinar on anthropology of epidemics there are three sessions one first first one will be chaired by the professor shubhir vishwas and next one will be chaired by the professor dr jyoti ratan ghosh and last session will be chaired by the dr sudeep we now i like to introduce professor shubhir vishash who is the chairperson of the first session of this webinar professor shubhir vishwas is a founder faculty member professor and head of the department of anthropology west bengal state university balasat west bengal he was also one of the founder faculty of the department of anthropology north bengal university darjeeling west bengal since 2001 he got the etc iuc associate seats at iias shimla his area of interest are anthropological demography gender health and bioethics लाकी 
we get among us professor arup ratan bandopadhyay who is the professor of the department of anthropology university of calcutta west bengal and another one speaker mohammad golam hussein who is the professor of department of statistics rajshahi university bangladesh sir welcome sir now i like to hand over the charge of the session to the professor shubhir vishwas sir over to you sir professor shubhir vishwas yes thank you so thank you uh, dr uh, i am really thankful to the organizer uh, for inviting me to chair a session where two uh, eminent scholar one in the field of anthropology uh, professor rahul ratan bandopadhyay and the second one in the field of uh, statistics especially uh, the health statistics uh, professor gulam hussain uh, will be there to deliver their lecture i am really thankful and honored uh, to be chair of such session uh thanks to the vice chancellor of uh, shadu ram uh, ramchand murgu university professor amir kumar panda and uh, also uh, thanks to principal of uh, both the colleges dr devakusha shahu and dr uh, i think deepak kumar bhia and three uh, organizer dr priyado dr arup mohundar and dr shantanu panda for inviting me uh it's really a nice topic especially uh, during the uh, covid uh, pandemic uh, they have chosen a topic on anthropology of epidemic uh, obviously it's, uh, i think so that it really will be helpful to our student and scholar not only the student and scholar but uh, many of our faculty also to understand the situation in anthropology capacity we have already uh, here to uh, lecture to invited lecture we started uh, so without wasting any time uh, i want to request uh, two of our uh, invited uh, speaker of today's session to start their lecture and the uh, hope of during this uh, two lecture the confusion between epidemic endemic and the pandemic which was i think uh, uh, which which is i think uh, is there among the mind of your scholar uh, that will be actually uh, given us today so professor arup ratan bandopadhyay uh i think he needs no introduction uh, before the student and scholar of uh, anthropology presently all the is uh, working as a professor of department of anthropology uh, calcutta university uh, he obtained his uh, bsc honors and msc degree from the same calcutta university and again in field in environmental sciences and phd from calcutta during this period he also have a ugc junior research fellowship uh, and i think he is the first recipient of such fellowship in the department of anthropology calcutta university he also received merit award from uh, calcutta university at that time as well as young scientist award from indian uh, science congress association again it's uh, it is probably the first time uh, a scholar from the department of anthropology calcutta university received this uh subsequently he became the president of the uh, uh, of of a, of a section of indian uh, science congress association which is called anthropological and behavioral sciences in 2013 um Dr. Bondopadhyay uh, received uh, about nine national extra-mural research uh, grants uh, from different uh, 
government agencies, including one from uh, outside, that, uh, that is from, I think, uh, uh, British Council for his work with Edinburgh University. Yeah. Dr. Bondabad, they published more than uh, 100 papers in different uh, related journals of uh, national and international deputy. He is a member of different uh, uh, academic organizations or bodies like uh, Asiatic Society, Indian Science Congress Association, Indian Academy of uh, Forensic Sciences, Indian National Confederation and Academy of Anthropology or INCA, and obviously in our own Indian Anthropological uh, Society, where recently he elected as a vice president of our society. Uh, Dr. Bandopadhyay is a four-time head of the department of uh, Department of Anthropology, Calcutta University, and uh, as a head and uh, as a head of the department, uh, he also uh, convener of the research advisory board of Anthropology of Calcutta University. So this is actually a nutshell of of, of his uh, brief bio data. So now may I request uh, Professor Arupratan Bandapathai uh, to deliver his lecture for us. Arupratan, please. Uh, thank you so much. I feel I'm audible and uh, visible too. So yes. Um, actually, I wanted. Thank you so much. And uh, I actually uh, find uh, Shubhi that given me a lot of kind words. And uh, unfortunately, I have seen only the uh, only Shubhi's head. And I definitely I will I will tell about this particular thing you know the morphological feature, and which will be included in my topic really. So I'm very much thankful. Before I go, I, I should be very much thankful because the first time uh, Dr. Arup Mojundar I uh, he contacted me for a webinar on this anthropology and epidemics, and I'm really thankful to whole of the organization from the different colleges and the different universities and to the vice chancellor that they recommended my name to uh, speak over here. So I'm really uh, very much excited to talk about this in anthropology, how anthropology people can go with this particular pandemics and whatever has been given in the epidemics, it has been given epidemics and then rightly said uh, by Professor uh, Shubhid Vishas that we must make some kind of um, the things of what is the pandemics and the epidemics for the young minds and also for the people that what I know about these things that how anthropology can uh, give uh, the impetus among the issues regarding this anthropology of it is given in the epidemics. So uh, as now, as for now, you have gone through my topic of the lecture. So I'm just sharing those, those ones who so I'm trying to share this one. So before I uh, giving my, and then before that outset, I'm giving my heartfelt thanks to uh, give me an opportunity this platform to talk about the people. I mean, I got right now the hundred people are listening. We are the participants, so I would like to have uh, my best. So I'll try my best to satisfy all of you. And if there is any kind of uh, clarifications, definitely I'll come back with the clarification. But nevertheless. So one should know that I am coming from the background of anthropology. I am not a virologist. I am not uh, the person which is very much uh, aware of this virus and other kind of thing. But I know a little bit of anthropology, how anthropology can contribute on this particular thing. Okay, so uh, I am just, just uh, cooperate me that whether uh, my slides are coming to you in a proper way. Uh, is it is it visible right now? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much. So it's visible. So today I'll be talking about the host risk factors and uh, the variation and immune responses that you got in anthropological perspective of pandemic. So I have given the pandemic, although this uh, seminar on the epidemic. So in course of time, I will definitely tell you about that. What would be uh, some kind of comparison of the pandemic epidemics? And definitely the endemics because this particular thing is very much important. So nevertheless, I start from the point in the bicultural because yesterday when I was there, so uh, so one of uh, the chairperson of this 
Dr. Bilhan Kandidas from uh, IS, ISK was talking about the bioculture. So uh, I have some kind of reservation to talk about this bioculture, you know, so going on the bio and the culture taking together. So uh, whenever I get time, so I uh, tell to the students what would be uh, like exactly so what I think. I get time, it's my personal so idea. I do not know uh, that whether all of you will come up, come up with me. So uh, this bioculture view that in anthropology, which is very much important, certainly that broadly considered as a joint the biological and cultural theory. So uh, through the period, it's become, becoming very obscure given the small groups, groups of research just kept out on main ideas and ideological commitments alike. But interestingly, what we find, this bicultural approach is really making a renaissance across the main arenas with anthropology because anthropology has four major disciplines we know that it was one is biological anthropology, one is uh, cultural anthropology by now. But in India, this is uh, cultural anthropology again is very hyphenated with the social hyphen, the culture. So that is the problem of the hyphen. So how, why these hyphens are coming? I mean, what we want to make some kind of attachment towards the hyphen. I mean, if you take social anthropology as goal well, or cultural anthropology, because we think that cultural anthropology can include the social anthropology. However, the social can include the culture. I do not know because there are many persons can you know, be very much befitting to make some kind of definition because uh, society is also there in the bees, you know, the insect. Uh, they have their society on the basis of the division of the labor, but the culture is not in there in case of the bees. So whether this culture can include the society or not, so there are many persons can explain this one. But my personal experience is that I'm going on this is a biocultural approach is largely come from the biology and the science side of the anthropology. And the questions seemingly reserved for the social cultural theorists are given by the biological anthropological perspectives, but not by the cultural theorists. But we always try to, because I'm specialized in biological anthropology and where the uh, professor Shubhi Vishas is, that whether this uh, well, um, response should be given by the social cultural <laughs> theories that whether we are going in the correct pathways so uh, that particular point that we are definitely getting some kind of reservation that whether this is we are in the corroborations of the idea of social and cultural theories is that what we are giving in the biological point of view anyway so this particular discourse will try to emphasize both the biological and cultural issues definitely in the broader selection. And finally, we would like to go for the facilitation for the development in the biological and cultural anthropology and anthropology of epidemics to the pandemics. So I start with this particular thing that the human history over the past many years. So these are the very I mean, common features that only the features I would like to explain here. I feel that you can see that the uh, formulations of uh, the uh, skeletal morphology of the skulls and you see that definitely there are some kind of dif differences in the skeletal morphology and if you go through once a while you will find the facial portions are become becoming reduced and the cranial portions are becoming higher i mean you are getting a higher uh, the cranial capacities and that is actually the human evolution uh, so one of the features that tragedy of the human evolution so how it is come up? So if you come up with the time, so we have some kind of table to culture. And if you go for understanding the biological anthropology and cultural anthropology as such, so we can have a table to culture that is comes from the old one. That's a simple flex and we know this is uh, owned by the Homo habilis. And then we are coming with this, coming to our microliths after up to here and the down there in the microliths. So how it's come? So firstly, it was a facultative bipedalism. And then this is this one, not a true bipedalism. Then we come up with a true bipedalism that we can define with the Hinto movement. And then we are coming with this one with the increased brain volume. So it's it's coming with the increased brain, brain volume. But in, in case of the increased brain, brain volume, there is an interesting factor that we can go that the bipedalism that we are working, walking in the erect bipedalism, we are walking in the two legs and freeing our hands. That is done earlier, but the brain size actually going increased after the bipedalism. So this is an interesting phenomenon. And with this into interesting phenomenon, what we get from here that our what would be the interpretation from the people from anthropology will be the modifications and the change in the biological features 
and the modification is the change of the two typology. So we find that there are some kind of modifications in the biological features and there are some kind of modifications in the cultural chain. And if we think about this biology, this is the most crucial point that we are thinking about this particular point. So whether we can make the hyphen of this, that making the hyphenated bit that we are trying to make a kind of, uh, I mean, I mean, a connections between the biology and the culture as a whole, but sometimes we fail to make it uh, between the connections of the biology and the culture uh, in a way that, so if you go for the bioculture, then uh, we have to make a definitions that the biology, that, I mean, a kind of direct relationship of the biology and the culture. And finally, I would like to mention in a humble way that we didn't get this kind of things in anthropology as such, except there is one best example that I can give that has been given in 1940s by the Livingstone uh, of the hemoglobin S and the agriculture that I have already mentioned here. If you can see the livestock farming and the agriculture. So wherever there is agriculture, we find there is some kind of adaptations in the hemoglobin. And yesterday, uh, Professor Premananda Bharati was talking about some kind of anime and I put up a humble uh, suggestions that a kind of enigma that we are getting that uh, in case of the northeast in India, we are getting the anemia is higher, might be due to some kind of genetic factors because the northeast in India, there are many people are affected with HBE. This is a genetic disorder. So if somebody is HBE, so definitely the anemia will be there. So uh, that would be the point that I would like to mention that how much we can go with this work in this particular age of cutting edge technology in the 21st century, that we can make a kind of just a kind of hyphen that in the biology and the culture because this is a modification in the change if you go come up in here some modification change in the biological features and then uh, the change in the two types so how how much we can make a uh, kind of relationship in that way so might be sometimes biology going ahead sometimes this culture is going ahead but i will definitely tell you culture it changes are much more faster than the biological changes so if you are going for the biological modifications and the cultural modifications, so, so my point of view that we cannot make uh, some kind of parallels that between the biological and the cultural, but there are some kind of, uh, kind of parallels. The story is different, so I'm not going for the story of this. So finally, we are going for some modification and subsistence patterns. So that is the most important thing. So we have started with the foraging, and then we have with the hunter gatherer, then we come up pastorals, and then the food producing economy. So we come up in the food producing economy, so livestock farming is very, very much important in case of the agriculture. And then this is livestock culture. So this is adoption of agriculture. I have already become the catastrophic in many ways that disrupted the human animal and environment and faces and <coughs> makes us feel over all the pathogens and lead to the zoonotic disease. So uh, this all the pandemics are coming with the zoonotic disease somewhere other that is very much related with the animals, so that's why uh, which are the non-human animals. So that's why we say that zoonotic diseases. So zoonotic diseases have become characteristics of the Anthropocene era. When we talk about this anthropology, Anthropocene that we are thinking about the human has evolved, and definitely the human has evolved from the Pleistocene to the Holocene because it started from the Pleistocene. So that is the Anthropocene era. So way of its transmission, it comes up with this infectious agent with the particular animals, so zoonosis, and then it's coming up, it's a kind of vicious circle that we are coming up with the zoonosis and the endogenous human infectious disease person to person. So many of the examples are there, the like influenza, HIV, SARS, MARS, SARS-CoV-2, recently the SARS-CoV-2, everything is a zoonotic disease. So in particular point that we wanted to make, a kind of comment that not all zoonotic diseases become pandemics, but most of the pandemics are caused by the zoonotics like the COVID-19 that we are talking right now. So I'm coming to the point to make some kind of clarifications about the endemic, epidemic, and the pandemic. So as uh, my colleague and my junior professor, Subir Bishas, wanted to know about this kind of thing, and also I, this is my responsibility to uh, let our students know about the differences between the endemic, pandemic, and the epidemic. So it is very simple. The disease is the present in the community at all time, but in the low frequency. That is called endemic, endemic, <coughs> because there is some kind of endemic disease is going on in 
uh, in the population, if you can think of Africa or in Asia, sometimes you get some kind of gastrointestinal diseases for what we call cholera or tuberculosis. So it's going on. So this is a kind of endemic. And epidemic is some point of time, the sudden rapid spread of an infectious disease within a short period of time. So one example I must give out on this particular aspect is Ebola. So Ebola started with some kind of country, but when it is pandemic, that is not really uh, confined to a particular country or a particular continent. This is really uh, going on with the entire world. So definitely the COVID-19 being the pandemic, it's never been an epidemic. So it's a very, um, very, very, very strict sense, or if you can think of a way, we can, uh, we can go ahead with this one. This is not really the epidemic, but this is really the pandemic. It's a higher version of the epidemic. It's not in the end. So how it is coming up? So nevertheless, it is very much common to us because we are with the media, and this is doing like, like there are spike proteins in the lab membrane. So if you go to because it started on um, 2019, I guess in the December and from 2020, we have sort of uh, publications of uh, this COVID-19, and we find the spike develop membrane and most interestingly this particular COVID has a single standard RNA approximately 26 to 30 kb inside but you want to have was over than uh, 3 lakh to uh, it's not 3 lakh 32 lakh to 3483 megabits uh, megabits power per pair so this is only 26 to 32 and this is coming up as a pandemic in case of the human. So must be there is some kind of issue. The issue is something like this. This particular small size KB that we are getting in the small size KB, they have enormous capacity to reproduce themselves because they don't need any kind of sexual reproduction. They don't need any kind of, I mean, if you want to make selections or some kind of that, it's only going to the, uh, the, the most uh, ancient kind of cell divisions, what we call the mitosis. So with this mitosis, they can make their cells rapidly bigger. If if there is a good host, like uh, your guest, if you are a good host, so, about so many of the uh, guests will be coming to you. So how it is coming? So this is the most uh, important factor that we have. We can really, I said the host genetics is very much important. So the three things are very much important in this particular thing in the SARS-CoV is in the human. So one is not going in the details of that, it's not going in details. So AC2 polymorphism. So AC2 is found in the X chromosome. And then we are coming to the TMPRSS2. So I have given this one that's very much important and this is very much related to the two hormones which is called androgen and word, which is called estrogen receptors. So androgen, you know, the estrogen is the most important thing that we got in case of the estrogen that we always get in case of the females. But in case of the androgen, this is actually having some kind of criteria in the male and females. So both have the androgen, so the males have more no androgen than the females. Uh, somebody want to tell anything to me? No, sir. No. Oh, okay. Somebody, I, I thought that somebody wanted to ask me something in this point. No problem, because I used to talk in uh, the class. So sometimes I used to talk to the student in, in, in the moment of I'm trying to say anything, but I'm open that after the seminar or uh, this webinar, anybody can ask me the questions who I provide my email ID. So if there is any, any kind of questions, so you can ask me in the email. So anyway, so uh, this is the point of being right on the US report. So the pain drive is the SARS-CoV-2 and the U.S. report is a human body. So the SARS-CoV-2 have the pain drive. So yeah, that, that have lots of information. So, so what kind of information do you like to have? So if you have uh, this U.S. report on the computer, if you think the computer is yourself, and if you have some kind of firewall, right? So you don't want to take the information from every point, you can uh, stop the information. So that is actually the host genetics. You know? So the firewalls are your host genetics. How much immune you are to uh, get entrance of the SARS-CoV-2 is the most important thing. And finally, one point is another point is very much important. So NP, NP, uh, NRP1, uh, neurophily one, and this is uh, another host factor for the SARS-CoV-2. This actually any kind of protein that can cleave. I mean, I can dissolve this particular thing. I mean. Uh, this uh, SARS-CoV uh, virus that can dissolve. So, so people are working with these things, and after 2020, having the people are disaster 
in uh, this COVID too, the people from the Italy, they make some kind of post-mortem and there are some kind of post-mortem results. And we find, first time we found that there is a RDS possibility because of the pulmonary uh, thrombosis, that is thrombosis there in the lungs, so I'll definitely tell you about in a different manner because as a uh, student of anthropology, I was definitely in the biology, I was definitely very much interested in what is happening in case why the people are getting died in case of the COVID-2 and the reason behind it that people are dying in the COVID-2. Um, SARS-CoV-2 because there was SARS-CoV-1 constant. So higher increase AC2 at the TMPRS2 expression level plays a major role in the spread of this infection. So what we find, because why this is very much important, because this ACE is very much important with the important pathway, which is called RA RAS pathway. So renin MGO enzyme aldosterone system and thus is leads to an ARDS acute respiratory distress syndrome and with this particular graphics you can see that if there is a kind of discombination or incompatibility between the ACE and AC2 so there is a CID polymorphism I have definitely tell you which is autosomal and AC2 is sex chromosomal so if there is a combination differences so that will come up with the vasoconstriction. So vasoconstriction, you can understand when we are in the cold region, we get some kind of vasoconstriction, you are getting kind of safe shivering. And I feel everybody you will have a experience, I mean, to go in the cold region in high altitude. So the vasoconstriction you are getting firstly with the shivering, you would like to go for adaptation that with the shivering. And second one, if you go to the uh, uh, cold region, you are feeling more urinating because of the fact that there is vasoconstrictions of your kidneys and other kind of thing. So most frequently the people first have this is acclimatization. That's not always, but whenever you reach there with a, so much of cold, then you go for shivering and then you are getting this arch of urinating sometimes and after that this will go up. So this is called vasoconstrictions and pro oxygen pro inflammations and the blue fibrosis and blue apoptosis. So this is apoptosis means a program cell death. So there is a non-program cell death. So that is the point of the, so that will be that COVID-19 is worsening. So what are the understanding of the evolving present passing days? That the most important thing is hemolysis that your red cells are breaking. So decrease hemoglobin level. So that is definitely that when the red cells are breaking. So there will be decreased hemoglobin level. And then with the idea of the postmodern in the Italy, I mean, on the mid of 2020, so the pulmonary thrombosis has been come up. And then hypoxia, which is this hypoxia is very much important. And for the anthropology, definitely the student of anthropology always go from the undergraduate study about this high altitude adaptations. And uh, when the student of anthropology is aware of this term, hypoxia is a condition which the body or region of the body deprived of adequate oxygen. So, whenever you go to the high altitude first time, you get some kind of uh, I mean, breathing trouble. But this has not always been there. So, after sometimes you will relieve from the breathing trouble. But if you think of the people in the high altitude, for example, if you go to the Hindus and the uh, people from the Andes, uh, high altitude, so they have this high hypoxia as their adaptation. So, always they are carrying with this hypoxia. So, this is the beauty of human. Uh, ecological rules, these are the ecological rules, so wherever you are, so you have some kind of biological adaptation, apart from the cultural adaptation that you can wear the clothes. Then comes up the inflammation, the most important thing in case of the COVID-19 is the cytokine storm. So the cytokine storm, in the mortality, what we get is a kind of inflammation, so all comes up, surge of inflammation is coming up to the region. If you have a kind of average or a wound in your face, you will find immediately it gets some swelling. So that swelling means that cytokine storms are coming, so lots of fluids are coming. So even there is, in case of uh, uh, COVID-19, you can find it out that is, this is there, is the ARDS, active respiratory disease syndrome. So everything is coming to your lung. So you are choking up your uh, breathing. So that is the product of the cytokine storm and the reduction of T cell proliferation. So I'm not going to detail of the T cell. So T cells are very much important. And reductions of T cells are very much important to fight back your immunity. And then comes up with the brain damage. So, so I'm not going into details. Of some, but sometimes I have talked about this brain damage in some kind of a webinar. And this is going on. This brain damage might have some kind of psychological problem. So now it's coming with this psychological problem. And finally, to the poor people who died out. 
with this COVID-19 that you know, these people kind of resist everything. So that's why it's a multiple organ failure. And then finally, we can have some kind of, it is possible, there is kind of male infertility. So I'm just raising up this question. So we ha I have some kind of responses about this male infertility. Anyway, there are some point of time that uh, if there's somebody is affected with the COVID, so there will be possibility of the brain damage and main infertility uh, in course of time. So that's our whole thing that I'm talking about, some kind of hypothesis. So I'll definitely tell you about the hypothesis, why I'm talking about this kind of thing. So probable results of hijack of the non-structural proteins, hijack of the egg, HP, what I'm saying, hemoglobin. And uh, there is a host of defense mechanisms. So one of the most defense mechanisms is after the protein that means the active phase protein that we have in our uh, cell. And also the interactions of the virus spike protein with the HP and which is using the CD147, so cluster of differentiation. So I feel as a student of anthropology who are listening, also the, uh, the student of anthropology might be very much interested in the cluster of differentiation because we always try to understand the variability. It, it may be the biological factors, may it be the cultural factors. So the variations, that is differentiation, is always very, very much interesting to us that we always try to understand the variation. And then we try to understand what kind of variation, the range of the variation. So, and the next time the people are speaking from, I mean, from the statistics can tell you what this range, I mean, the minimum, maximum range, that is most important, the variation and the central tendency, so how much variations and most importantly the outliers are very much important what we call the standard deviations so how much differentiation is very much there so from the standard deviations we actually start on the research why there is standard deviation why the people are not like that why are some people most of the people are making a skewness towards i mean the negative skew or the uh, positive skew so i think that starts on uh, the thinking about the process so it's haptoglobin is very much important to us because it's efficient at diagnostic to the HB toxicity because I said in the top uh, there is hijack of HB no, no. so the haptoglobin comes up and that we can get no, in the plasma and in the plasma there are many more things and where the haptoglobin is one of the most important thing. So it has both a polymorphism so definitely can tell you about this polymorphism and what kind of the effect that we can find in case of the COVID-19 with a review of the literature we got but no, we have some kind of idea of this happening. I have done some kind of work with this uh, effects on uh, 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 but this is not the one I am not going to go for the Definitely, this particular thing is being very much So, human haptoglobins has located in room number 16, and primarily, and we have. Two kinds of allele. One is allele is HP1, which is ancestral allele that we get in case of the non-human primates, but in case of the human, it comes up. Uh, the genotype does HP2, but that's why we get three kinds of genotypes. One is called HP11 and HP2. So HP1 allele has some kind of protective role in the immune response. And because uh, maybe it includes severe immunological condition because it's of smaller size, so maybe this is one of the risks. But eventually, we find this HP1 is not making very much um, effect, but it is making some kind of risk to the HP1, and then I'll come to that particular point in a way that anthropology, why anthropology is very much important with the healthiness and disease transmission because. Uh, operance development and over the years that anthropology have been particularly valued for their ability to access of those respected why this this one so definitely coming within a couple of minutes with that particular point of those risk factors and actually broadly speaking anthropology fit in three different interventions one is program design formative research interpretation investigation response and finally the event analysis and post hoc assessment that is the most important after something that we can have some kind of post hoc assessment. What have been done? And we are making the variance, I mean, what is actually making the most predictable that is coming in the post hoc assessment. I feel after me, so, uh, Professor from uh, Bangladesh will be talking about some kind of, he is coming from the statistics, he is very much able to tell about this kind of post hoc assessment uh, will be very much important for understanding the exact. Point of predictor. So basically, study through the time and space, and then it is not new. Really, anthropology's contribution in the public health has been written firstly by uh, what I got in the GP murder. It was in 1915, and if you go come down back, I mean, it's not very much clear. I feel that if you come 
um, there. That you will find it is firstly written in 1951 and to all India its contribution to the public health. And definitely yesterday, Professor Shapovishas was talking about the Ebola. Yes, this is a game changer, the importance of anthropology in public health intervention. And you can see that when the people are getting so many of the runs that we feel that anthropology would like to go for understanding the rapid responses that grant awarded like uh, 297160. Um, so it's possible that if somebody is like to go for public health intervention and anthropology, and finally that we have anthropology in public health emergency and what is anthropology good for, that's paper I am very much amazed with uh, looking after this paper and going through this paper and this is published in 2008 in the three years back. I really find this is really good that uh, this has come up in the BMJ Global Health. So really anthropology can do a lot of things, anthropology known about, what are the new findings. So that's why I said that postdoc assessment and making the research design. And I feel as a student of anthropology, the best subject that we can interfere with any kind of I mean, is communicable disease or non-communicable disease and other kind of thing with the people's perception. So the host risk factor in anthropological aspects in epidemiology, what we said, epidemiology. So what is specific? Perspective, gender specific, and then ethnic specific. So, ethnic specific is an anthropological review, gender specific is also, also an anthropological review, and also the age specific is an anthropological review because anthropology people think from where we are, we have not been born. From there, we think about uh, what kind of uh, what kind of baby is coming out to the world from that age specific to the gender specific, whether that means the male and female, and if there is female, so biologically. Or culturally, we have some because in, in, in this gender specific, we must say that there, there must be sex and then coming to the gender because gender is made with the socialization and the sex is a biological fact, factor. <coughs> now, as ethnic specifications, so definitely every ethnic group has their specification. For example, how do you know a person uh, which is coming from the northeastern region? And this is a kind of we say that is a normal feature, right? like straight here. So there will be the ethnic specification that we can see as a whole that you can find in your own person uh, coming around to your uh, area locality, having a, a kind of um, curly hair and uh, thick evocated lip and very tall. And you can find it as a must be this person is coming from the African origin. So the ethnic, ethnic specifications is the morphology. Nevertheless, you are going to the biology itself. When you are thinking about the biology, biology and the morphology can tell you a lot of things. So we have gone through with some kind of related publications. So we have published this one in the COVID-19 and epidemiological post genetic appraisal. This has been published in um, April 2020. And we tried to understand that that time there was a kind of debate whether this the males are much more affected or the females have been much more affected what about the age. I mean the more aged persons are making themselves affected or not. So we gone through with this one and we find good results and that has been published in uh, 2020. And then we try to make a publication so like say that a kind of antagonistic effect of the hijacked HB and the haptoglobin. So we make a kind of all of them are the reviews because we didn't have any very work we could not do it in the laboratory, you know that's a total shutdown. So we try to make some kind of review that might be the premises that we can start on the lab work. So that was in the habit of the volume of the COVID review. So that was published in uh, 2021. And finally, we wanted to make a kind of reprint. The reprint is there. And that I'll definitely tell you something about the HLA and the COVID-19. So that is which is still now in the reprint stage that is not come up with a good review that is uh, there in the 2021. So we find the three things are very much important with the, this uh, host genetics. So we tried out some kind of idea. So these are my team, you know. So uh, Dr. Morish, Dr. Dr. and the challenges so I'm very much lucky to get this kind of students with me are always uh, giving me encouragement to go with this one and uh, make me thinking about those kind of things who are really uh, overestimated myself sometimes. And, uh, sometimes I'm very much happy that they may be thinking about this kind of things. So aging is a risk factor. So definitely a higher age has some kind of risk factor. You can think of this one because AC2 expression, so when AC2 expressions are high and key whereas it's true. Uh, its expression is always high being used by the higher education level and what in the children are in puberty there will be no androgen, so definitely there will be some kind of age effect. 
So meals are at high risk because of the X chromosome I say AC2 and counter uh, actions with the repressed AC2 by the estrogen and the androgen dependent chain PRSS expressions. And recently, what we got the metallopeptidase domain in involved with the AC2 into domain and steady increases of the estrogen may account for the observed COVID sex disparity. But what about the TFRSS2? So we have been thinking about this particular thing for a long time. So, and what we find, this COVID-19 susceptibility among those who are predisposed with the high androgen and the hyper, high expressions and the hyper, hyper androgenism. And the effect is something like a androgenic alopecia. So, sometimes you get in the media that the people having baldness have, sometimes the media comes up, baldness are more susceptible for the COVID-19. Actually, this pattern of baldness, why this is coming up? Because of this hyper androgenism, because the androgen, excess androgen makes some kind of uh, hair loss. And so definitely this is X-linked. Therefore, the male pattern and the female patterns are not equal. So most of the people, you can understand that this is a sex increased character. So definitely this is not sex linked. What I said, this is sex increased character. So definitely their patterns are changed. And there are many more sex influences character. For example, uh, we had most of, for example, the second toe of the females are used to be. Generally, the second toe of the foot in the females are greater than the toe, red toe. It's going on the sex influence. There are many more characters that we can do with the sex influence character. So benign prostatic hyperplasia and if there is a sibling, this uh, this other I'm talking about the male and female. There is a polycystic ovary syndrome now. This is very because are very much important right now. So if the siblings or uh, maybe this is for the female, you can understand the siblings are the males. So there may be a chance of uh, this androgenic hyperplasia. If the brother is there, there is a chance. So we are working on this to make it much more clear. So male suffering from prostatic hyperplasia, all the people suffering from the polycystic ovary syndrome and androgenic are high risk. So they are with the high risk. So I'm talking about the who will be the high in the high risk category. So the management should be there that if you get this kind of morphology, so management will be there in the hospitals and whatever these persons are much more risk factors. So ethnic variations of the host genetics. So firstly the ethnic variations, SEV polymorphism. So in S E2 polymorphism, common. And rare missense variants were being found over in AC2 X chromosome. So, representing the Italian European population, extremely rare in the Asian population, might be the basis of the high highest fatality rate. So, CFR means here always I'm talking about the not the fertility rate. This is case fatality rate in the Europe. And then we are coming to the host static variations in the AC1 and AC2, that is the ID polymorphism. And what we find the D alleles, so ID, that insertion and deletion. So deleted alleles are the previous level of AC2 in post double bonding. So what we find that ACT is very much important. I mean, there's a very frequent in case of Europe and the northwestern part of India. So definitely, if you go for the COVID tracker, you will find that this fatality rate in the northwestern India is very high. Then, if you come to the northeastern part of India where ACI, I mean, insertion is very high. So, another thing is AP polymorphism. So, so, definitely, I have already mentioned that. So, maybe present the video there is with one and then uh, COVID 19 severity outcome. So, I'll definitely come up within a couple of minutes uh, with this particular side. I'll not take really much more of your time. So, what we get the AP variations are the most genetic side. That, what we call the higher confirmed cases of death in ACT alleles and prevalent of HP without alleles. So if you can come up with this Western region, you will find this is a situation still. Now if you do the COVID tracker, you will find this particular thing. And least confirmed cases, if you come to the Northeastern India, there is really least confirmed cases still now. The AC1 alleles is prevalent and HP2 alleles. So we can take into consideration whether they are in the less risk or not. So another thing is very much important that is over there in the treatment. This is HL, so I have just given an interaction so who have uh, get the Nobel Prize because of the recognition of the self and non-self. There's a John Rosa from France in 1958. Why this person is very, very much um, adorable to me because of the fact that this... It's about 350. Okay, so uh, how much time will you get? Just five minutes more? Okay. Five minutes? Okay, just five minutes more. So why I am very much interested with this particular one because he talked about his autobiography with the anthropology because he wanted to know him himself with the anthropology. So I'm going very fast. But this in H HLA one, so what, what we get, there are some kind of protective values and the variants of the classification. 
So you can find out uh, this is protective alleles and this is risk alleles because uh, this HLA has an enormous possibility of polymorphism. So these are the eight risk alleles. Uh, we find this is Indian and African population. There is a combination of Indian and African population. So the US descent with the African descent having some kind of hardest heat in the clearly. So these are the things that has already been published by Pavo and who is my friend from Max Planck. Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology, and, uh, and this has been situation that need up for gene. And then what we find that there is some kind of risk alley in the E and O blood group, and what we find that this particular trait in the northeastern India has prevalence of the O blood type. And this is not new. The people has already gone through with this one uh, earlier back in 1966, and he was fine. Emma is there, so Monishan Chakraborty is there, who is from anthropology. So this has been flying up by anthropologists for a long time. Frederick Fogel and Emma Chakraborty. So studies try to identify the culprits. So what is socioeconomic status, obesity, comorbidities, demographic structure. So this particular paper we have already published in uh, Human Diversity in the Northeast India and Socioeconomic Status has published in uh, European Journal of Clinical Medicine. So what we wanted to know about this socioeconomic status, the hemoglobin has some kind of iron status, has some kind of relationship with the detrimental effects with the iron is a crucial note, it's a point, point of two points of either more hemoglobin or less hemoglobin. So what we nutritional immunity is very much important for what we got is per capita income is very much important and that's why we say the socioeconomic status has some kind of relationship with this COVID-19 or not so petrol and high and what we got from the, our paper we find this uh, case fertility rate is very low in case of Africa whether this is uh, iron deficiency anemia or not so we try to make this explanation so we open up this assumption and then I'm going for the obesity so definitely you can think of these two kinds of obesity so in case of the males and females, so the story of why chromosome is there, why there's that mutation, I have this in fact, and in case of the females. So definitely we find this one. So so we find this is obesity related things and people having more obesity as a critical condition in case of the COVID-19. So demographic structure of the population in this book. So we have tried out the demographic structure. And in this particular demographic structure, we find that demography, if this is a touch mold, don't, don't share. So we have a kind of point that in India that we have a low, I mean, the mean age group of India is very low and that is affected by the higher higher age group, age group has affected COVID by, by COVID-19 which is there in the Europe and other countries. And then the population density is very much important because the population density, because if I understand you aren't it right now in Italy, you are a lot of population density was higher. And the scenario is consistently there in the Arab Islam in the Mumbai. So population density is high. So co-residency pattern is also very much important, which is actually really so we go for the intra family and transmission because we in India there is a culture, you know, with, with the joint families and extended families. So I'm just come up uh, Professor Subi Bishop with the two or three. Just one slide there. So concluding remarks. So genetic factors and other factors. So I said this is epigenetic. This is not the point that I can go with this epigenetic factors to explain how this epigenetics works. So this might be one webinar that I can talk about this one because all that I can learn from you and what I have, I would like to share. So finally, what comes up with this zoonosis beyond the human and animal environment. So prevention is better than cure and most risk factors provide a useful tool for understanding high risk individuals and take proper preventive measures. So thank you so much uh, for giving me so much of time. I feel that I'm exceeded for 10 minutes or so. Thank you so much. So if you have uh, questions or anything. So I'm very much happy to tell you about this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Uruddha. Uh, but I think due to paucity of time, we have to uh, invite our uh, second invited lecture. So if, if there is some time and uh, after that and organizer, if organizer is allowing, so uh, we can have some uh, interaction with our speaker uh, at that time. Otherwise, uh, I think it's better to uh, uh, leave your comment or leave your question in chat box. So I think it will be better. So the second, uh, thank you for the uh, second speaker. Uh, Professor Mohammed Bolam Hussain uh, is presently working as a professor and convener of Health Research Group 
রাজশাহী ইউনিভার্সিটি বাংলাদেশ we taught uh, theory and practical courses uh, on basic statistics operational research health statistics and epidemiology we also guides uh, research student of msc mphil and phd courses in the field of medical statistics epidemiology and obviously uh, biological anthropology he obtained uh, his uh, bachelor degree uh, in mathematics so he is a mathematician uh, his msc is also in pure mathematics both from rashtra university then uh, his phd in secular changes in the dimension of Japan, japanese adults over eight over eight decades from Tokyo Metropolitan University and post doctorate with the tissue engineering group of University of Malaysia after that he joined uh, Rashtra University Department of Statistics in 1994 as lecturer and subsequently promoted to professor in uh, 2006 professor Bulamushan published Three books, 19 books, chapter 136, journal articles, and 47 um, full paper in uh, conference proceeding. He has guided two MPhil, six PhD, and one postdoc students. He is also editorial board members of uh, uh, different uh, journals of national and international reputation, including BMC Papi. So, Ulam Bhai, now we see your chat, please. Uh, uh, mouth light is visible now? Yes, yes, yes. Mouth, okay, thank you very much. Everybody, good afternoon, very good afternoon everybody. Thank you very much, organizing committee uh, of the international webinar on anthropology of epidemics for inviting me as the invited speaker. So first of all, I would like to uh, request Professor Shubhi, please give me one minute. If I disconnect within one minute, hopefully I will I will uh, reconnect. So please give me one minute. Okay. If I will dis uh, disconnect. So <coughs> the comparative assessment of nutritional starters. between tribal and non tribal adults in the northern part of bangladesh dear audience this is the title of my today's discussion actually this study is the part of all of my phd fellows research project and you know i am not belonging in anthropology department but since long time i am trying with my group to apply statistical model and mathematical model in anthropological data and as well as the health related information please the second slide i would like to share our presentation in different section like introductions methods result discussion calculation and recommendation i know everybody knows what is nutritional status according to inclusivity of nutritional start of the condition of the body in those respect influenced by the diet and we also know that nutritional starter is directly or indirectly related to the health starters of a particular population particular countries or particular nation and also we you know the 
nutritional status of adults is measured by their body mass index. The body mass index is derived from person weight and height. This is very well known for everybody. And also you know, the most widely used category of body mass index for adults. In this study actually, we use the above categories, underweight, normal weight, overweight, and average. Luckily, our population, can I possibly write now the classification of obese into, into pre-obese, obese class 1, obese class 2, obese class 3. <clears throat> the body mass index is considered, you know, and direct measure of nutritional status changing in body mass index can play good roles in the course of person's health. Therefore, the BMI can use as an indicator of health status and association with some diseases can be expected. We know the obese people is more likely to get some non-communicable diseases such as hypertension, heart disease, diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, and other types of cancer. On the other hand, the thin people, I mean the undernourished people, have more chance to get the hip fracture, and for the female, more likely to deliver the birth, uh, low birth weight children. And also, it, it is also established that the undernourished people, some, I mean the undernutrition is uh, associated with the, uh, with the mortality. So this is very important to do research in nutritional startups. Now, I would like to share the present startups, I mean the present characteristics of Bangladeshi population which are related to health and nutritional startups. The first drinking water, the 95% household have access to the improved source of drinking water. Sanitation, 65% household have improved sanitation facilities. Hand washing, 39% of the population have basic hand washing facilities. And electricity, most of the household have access to electricity, 91%. Mobile phone, almost all households have mobile phone. Birth registration for children, 25%, children under 5 have already birthed stamp. And education, only 20, now, now 21 females and 18 males are, have no education, but others are educated. So school attendance, net attendance ratio, 86% for primary school and 55% for secondary school. So this is the household characteristics of Bangladeshi population. The characteristics of Bangladeshi mother, what are the characteristics of Bangladeshi mother? I am talking about the present situation. So marital starters, 94% even married women in the productive age are currently married. I will already discuss about the education, that I will say explore of mass media. The television is the most access from for the media and as I mentioned earlier, the most of the household having television. Employment, almost half of the even many women currently employ and increase for 30% 2011, 33% 2014 and 48%. 2011, 17 to 18. Occupation, the majority of even married women who are employed are involved in poultry farming or cattle raising. So maternal health, you know, during the pregnancy, the mother, the who recommended every mother should visit that ANC, uh, ANC, at least four times. What is the prevalence of mothers who already visited four times in Bangladesh? Look at this. 
82 parts and masters and currency CV star in, in data 2014. I mean, I am I am pick up the uh, statistics from Bangladesh Demographic and Health Survey. So you know, Bangladesh Demographic and Health Survey collected data overall Bangladesh. So it is a representative sample. So in 2014, the statistics 74% now 82%. Place of delivery still near to uh, 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 this is half of the delivery at home and 49 deliveries at facility, I mean the clinic, clinic or hospitals, uh, government hospitals or private hospitals. Caesarean delivery, this is the Alhambra situation in Bangladesh, also in India I know, because the day by day the Caesarean delivery rate is increasing. But you know, uh, you know, when the mother delivery that cesarean, at that time, from that time, the mother will be suffering some complication in her life. Uh, uh, more, more than half of the mother and newborn receive PNC from the medically training provider within two days of delivery. Now, nutritional status of adults. Earlier, I would like to inform you, BDSS, the collected data over on the countries, only for women in reproductive age and different characteristics, their household characteristics, their personal characteristics, their family planning characteristics, etc. But this is the first time, 2017 and 18, they collected data also male from that also male so the nutritional status of women the proportion of ibar married women who are the undernourished uh i mean the has decreased sharply decreased the undernourished but overnourished over the rapidly increase professor bharati yes got it he presented data on obesity with the nationally represented data of India, the same result he found. Nutritional starters of men, local nutritional starters, the result shows that 20% of men are thin and 80% are underweight or obese. The mean body mass index among men is 21.6 kg per meter square. 13% of rural women and 19% of urban women are thin. Conversely, 28% of rural women and 43% of urban women are overweight or obese. So, <clears throat> look at the figure. The obese individual, as I mentioned earlier, the 10 only, I, 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 I'm showing the 10 only the mother in reproductive age because I don't have data of father or man previously. So look at this. The obvious is increasing tendency. Look the figure increasing tendency. How about the overweight? Also increasing tendency. But normal, almost same. Mildly thin, decreasing tendency. And moderately and severely thin, also decreasing tendency. So Bangladesh are facing, still now Bangladesh are facing the dual burden of, of, uh, of adult people, sir, also the children. Women uh, empowerment, I'm talking ab about the women empowerment and uh, uh, I would like to mention in here only the women empowerment related to their health. So <clears throat> look at the ownership of National ID card, pa uh, participation in decision making, this is very important. Overall 59% of currently married women participated in all in all three specific household decisions regarding their own health care, household purchases, and visit of family or relative. So, near to 60% married women, they participate when the decision uh, about uh, decision of their family regarding the health care, household purchases, and other things. And access of health services. Jail services, 33% of urban women 
at 24 percent rural women lived less than one kilogram kilometer away from the post office and education faculty as i mentioned earlier income generating organization availability of family planning and health services 96 percent women have access to the satellite clinic uh, and uh, and the health facilities look at this 86 percent of class that have the health facility within their village or mahalla so health and family planning worker, 91% of sample cluster have government affiliated health and family planning worker available. So this is very good situation of Bangladesh regarding the uh, access of health services. Now, now I am talking about the about the uh, sustainable development goal. You know. Bangladesh already achieved some goal by 2015 from MDG. I am talking about the two goals which are related to health. Number one, reduce child mortality. Bangladesh already achieved by 2015. Improve maternal health. Bangladesh now on track. So Bangladesh is trying to achieve every goal under the sustainable development by 2030. We believe that and hope and we hope and believe that Bangladesh can do it because, because some indicator with the SDG, I mean the uh, some indicator related to SDG is rapidly increasing or rapidly decreasing. So, <coughs> our suggestion in here, if Bangladesh wants to achieve every goal or some important goals, right now Bangladesh should distribute every facilities to all people equally. And Bangladesh Especially low, the indigenous people still they are suffering from some problems. Then Bangladesh will get the achievement from the sustainable development by 2013. So, you know, you know, in 2015, the World, World Bank reclassified Bangladesh as the lower middle income country. How about the country's indigenous communities? The situation is far from the challenging. It is further compounded by the absence of adequate, uh, uh, adequately disaggregated government data on indigenous communities. However, Bangladesh broad strategies have made efforts to include the indigenous peoples as ethnic community in the population census of 2011. What is ethnicity or type definition? Bangladesh is a country of culture and ethnic diversity, you know. So Bangladesh, but there are so many, there are so many indigenous community are living in Bangladesh on report shows that 45 percent 45 indigenous people are living in the different places in bangladesh but but the another report shows that near to 50 uh, 60, 60 indigenous people are living in different places in bangladesh It, the it, ethnic minority can be categorized into two groups according to their uh, location, living location. You know, some ethnic, ethnic minorities are living in Chiragang Hill Tracks and some are living in Plain Land. So according to, to their living condition or living location, they are classified into two classes, Plain Land, ethnic minority, and Kitagang Hill does keeping minority. Look at the figure. So Kitagang Hill does uh, 
they are leaving the chakma marma and other indigenous peoples and north bengal in north bengal they are leaving look at this the uh, triangle red color the north bengal of bangladesh they are leaving santal organs monda and other indigenous peoples but most of them santal demography profile of indigenous people in bangladesh 15 lakh 86000 and 141 indigenous peoples total peoples in bangladesh which represent 1.8 percent of total population of this country the majority of indigenous people live in the plain districts of the country and the rest of the chitagang hill tracts in the shai district near to 3 percent ethnic minority are living and 56 percent in rangamati so the other places as per example the gajipur and other places gajipur rangamati chirang and other places some uh, indigenous people are living also have their socio economic characteristics on the ethnic minority look at the poverty higher than the national average average income less than the national average over will be depends on agriculture sector salary job or business 30 percent in chitagang hill tax and less than one percent in the plain land indigenous people on average two third of the uh, ethnic minorities in the plain are functionally land land led so <clears throat> bangladesh government and other some national or international or uh, uh, ngo are trying to make the change of indigenous people uh economic conditions as well as they are try to increase the education levels as a result as a result uh the uh, the indigenous peoples uh are uh, the, the, the 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 education levels of indigenous peoples are increasing and and also the economical conditions are increasing so i think this is the best time to compare in different aspect or different characteristics or different variables between indigenous people or tribal, tribal peoples and non tribal peoples living in the same regions and people i mean the there are so many peoples are doing research in different way i mean that they, they consider only the socio demography factors but to the best of our knowledge no research sir as try to compare the nutritional or health status between the tribal and non tribal adults living in the same regions but that's why we attempt to we attempt to investigate the first investigate the prevalence of malnutrition for both groups groups and then find the risk factor of malnutrition and in addition we wanted to compare in nutritional status between tribal and non tribal adults in the shai district what are the research portion of the study the following research portion of the study we set up what are the prevalence of nutrition malnutrition both under and over nutrition among the tribal and non tribal adults living in same region in the rural area of rashahi what are the associated factor of malnutrition among the tribal and non tribal adults what is the different nutritional status between tribal and non tribal adults if you ask me what is your hypothesis definitely definitely i put my hypothesis in here there is no difference in nutritional status between the tribal and non tribal there are some factors are associated with malnutrition and a remarkable number of 
travel and non travel suffering from under uh, under nutrition and over nutrition this is our or my hypothesis research hypothesis look at the materials and methods our target area i mean the the rural area of kashai district was the target area of this study why rural area because most of the tribals are living in rural area as i mentioned earlier in dashai district or the northern part of bangladesh most of the tribals are santal so we consider only the santal and we consider a place where the santal peoples are living so please go for sampling technique or uh, sampling study population look at the study population the male and female adults we consider our study population this is the tribal population the santal peoples the female are working in the field and the non non tribal uh, uh, the uh, the female in here and the tribal and non tribal both are working in the field look at the <coughs> look at the santal distributions of the different district in rashahi division and rangpur division in rashahi 26,469 Santal peoples are living in the different upazila in the Shai districts. What are the inclusion criteria? Only married adults age 18 have no serious disease and living in the study area are considered. We recruited only non-pregnant women because we are trying to compare. nutritional status status suppose a determination our formula provided that 329 samples each sufficient for this study over initially we considered 500 household and for every, for each household we considered husband and i both sampling and data collection procedures probability study by random sampling and non probability per person sampling with proportional allocation technique was used in this study for selecting 500 household why non uh, pro, uh, non probability sampling because you know if we apply the probability sampling then we may uh, we, uh, we, 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 it is possible to select a area where we, we did not find the sample peoples for that's why but we have selected a upazila from nine upazila of ashahi district named gudagari where the santal people are living and from the gudagari upazila the bogram is the name of the union where the santal people are living also selected purposely purpose purpose sampling and the third step based on the number of tribal and non tribal people household 90 to 18.4 percent and 488 to 1.6 tribal and non-tribal was selected respectively by stratified random sampling with proportional allocation. Finally, some people did not agree to provide their data, so finally 420 household we selected from our selected household. So the self level of questionnaire. was used to collect the information from each selected household and for each selected peoples we measure their height and weight what are the outcome variables nutritional status was the outcome variable of this study and it was measured by body mass index dependent variables some socio economic factors uh, and demographic factors were considered as independent variables so statistical analysis we used descriptive statistics frequency distribution to find the prevalence of malnutrition of tribal and non tribal both independent sample test to find the differences between two groups in continuous variables two way analysis of variance two year analysis of variance we used because we want to find at the same time the the effect of a variables on body mass index 
and effect interaction effect between two variables. I mean the interaction effect of two variables. Jet proportional test we use to find the difference between two proportions. And logistic regression model, we use the, this model to find the classification of our data. It starts on the basis of nutritional data. So the result and discussion look at the result. This is a socio-economic and demographic characteristics of tribal and non-tribal. So look at this. The maximum tribal, I mean the samples is uh, above 40 years and also non-tribal uh, uh, 35.3, I mean the above 40 years. And the age group for women, the age group for women 31 to 35, this group, I mean, that is maximum for both tribals and non tribals Education level, we mentioned earlier, I mean, the, the non tribals people are so much educated than the tribals people. Education level of women, the same scenario for the gender. socio and demographic characters, again, the same tables. So, occupation, most of the, I look at this, most of the women of the tribal peoples are working in field, but most of the non tribal peoples, women are working in house. And having hygienic toilet, yes, 58% tribal have, uh, have hygienic toilet, and 50, almost same number, they, they, are, uh, uh, they have hygienic tablet, uh, yeah, toilet. And having the safe, uh, safe water access, Yes, 95% for the tribal peoples and 92% for the non tribal peoples. Having electricity, as I mentioned earlier, 80% for the tribal peoples, 78.4% for the non tribal peoples. And uh, having television, 100% and near to 100% for both groups. Group. <coughs> the association between nutritional study and ethnic groups by gender. Look at the chi square test. The chi square test shows that the association is associated, I mean, the significant for the men and women both. And effect of nutritional starts on ethnicity for both sexes. So we apply, I applied in here the logistic regression model to find the effect of nutritional starts on ethnicity for both sexes. Be, be brief. Uh, please give me some time, some the 10 minutes, can yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay, but uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> reduce it to zero. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, <clears throat> look at this for male, the male for, uh, uh, in here, uh, the tribal peoples uh, is more likely to get normal rate than non tribal peoples. And also the female, the same rate charts, but in addition, we got the <coughs> overweight also, I mean the non underweight, the tribal tribal people is more likely to get the underweight than non tribal women. And the classification of ethnicity by their left and national startup. Look at the classification. Overall percentage 82.9. That means our model can able to classify the ethnicity by 82.9%. So miss class classification rate only very few, so our model is good model. Completion of the nutrition is the between tribal and non-tribal adults. Look at this. The jet test shows that uh, the main for the uh, normal and the uh, normal and uh, over nutrition are significant between two groups. And for the women also, normal and uh, over nutrition are significant between two groups. Look at the normality of BMI. Now I am going to apply parametric test. For that's why we need to check our data is normally distributed or not. So we look that our data is uh, normally distributed. The histogram shows that our data is normally distributed. For that's why we can use we use the parametric test, such as the t-test and ANOVA. So look at the main, I mean the in here, the weight is different. I mean the non-tribal weight is Significantly higher than tribal, tribal, I mean the sample. And also the body mass index is different. 
the non uh, non samtal is higher than the samtal and height weight body mass index for three three uh, dimensions i mean the two dimension and one index is for the women also different significantly different for the nutritional start by social economic factor competition look at this the anova the anova we applied anova when we have more than two groups the anova shows that education i mean the for non tribal is uh, significant among the uh, uh, among the among the nutritional starters for the non tribal and also occupation for both groups is for men and the interaction interaction effect education or uh, occupation uh, put the division to change the nutritional starters of the tribal but for non uh, uh, non tribal no and education how the monthly income also the put the contribution for the female female or almost the same uh, results the education you can find the differences in tribal for uh, non tribal no occupation for non tribal tribal no and the how the monthly income for tribal non tribal no and the education how the monthly income the combined impact is significant for non tribal and the education or occupation combinedly Uh, effect on the uh, nutritional status of the tribes. So this is the what is the extent and limitation of this study? The major extent of the present study is that it is the first time we we try to compare the nutritional status between the tribal and non-tribal. And this is the unique nature of our study. Besides our findings, have the eminent utility in reducing the prevalence of malnutrition. However. the major limitation of our study is the cross sectional study you know cross sectional study can be possible to monitor less time moreover it was the confined to specific the geographical area we have considered only the russia area the russia area so the santal people are living the different area of uh, northern part of bangladesh and we consider only the nutritional status we can we could consider another factor i mean the health related factors unfortunately we did not consider Clearly, more research are needed regarding health and nutritional status of tribal and non-tribal uh, uh, adults living in the same area in Bangladesh. Now, conclusion: We found that prevalence of overnutrition among the non-tribal was higher than tribal for both sexes. Education, occupation, and how their monthly income are important confounding factors of malnutrition. The interaction effect of education and occupation. and education and how the monthly income on body mass in this for significant for tribes men was the interaction effect of the educational occupation and education and how the monthly income were significantly for the tribes and non tribes to men expectancy so what are the recommendation based on our findings we believe and hope that we our government we our government follow the findings they can improve their policy to reduce or remove the malnutrition from the adults i mean the tribes and non tribal both living in the same area and not only that if the government the government can follow the findings they can find the factor which responds to the uh, respond to make difference in nutritional status between the tribal and non tribal people so here uh, thank you very much thank you thank you uh, sorry for giving uh, five or 10 minutes thank you thank you thank you thank you gulam bhai uh, for a nice presentation uh, nice presentation so as you can understand that uh, we have already exhausted another uh, uh, 30 minutes from the next session so uh, there will be no discussion with participant even there will be no uh, chairman's comment uh, <laughs> for the session just uh, shifted uh, the mic to the organizer for the next session thank you all. thank you very much uh, professor subir vishwas uh, for uh, chairing this sessions very nicely and uh, uh, there was uh, two speakers one is uh, 
professor arup pratham bandhavata who is uh, nicely presented uh, his uh, speech and uh, he talk about the hbe uh, uh, endemic pandemic and epidemic and uh, uh, also the post hoc analysis importance of post hoc analysis and morphological matters and uh, after that uh, mamad kolam hasan uh, he also uh, uh, presented very nicely and uh, he critically uh, explained the tribal and non tribal nutritional status of bangladesh uh, thank you uh, both of you uh, professor arup pratham bandopadhyay and uh, mamad kolam hasan sir now uh, i like to uh, go to the next session uh, this session will be chaired by the dr jyoti ratan ghosh uh, before going to invite him uh, i like to uh, brief uh, about him uh, he is the deputy dean of students welfare vishwabharati he uh, was joined as an assistant professor in the department of anthropology vishwabharati Uh, Shanti Niketan in 2009 he was awarded phd by the university of calcutta he has in his credit research project of university grant commission as well as the several research papers in national international journals and books recently he was awarded kansu international fellowship in china by the people's republic of china uh, his research is focused on the human growth and body compositions human nutrition forensic anthropology and non communicable diseases sir welcome you uh, for chairing this sessions over to you sir sir please unmute yourself okay oh, uh, thank you and uh, thank you very much uh, first of all i would like to thank the organizer and also the principal of the seva bharati mahavidyalaya Uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to session a chair in this international anthropology webinar uh, so as we know that we are uh, running out of time so without wasting time i would like to invite all the uh, presenters to present their paper in this session and one thing that i would like to uh, mention that as we are uh, running out of time so please uh, this is my request to please make it uh, shorter if possible uh, so that we can uh, manage some time so there are a total of uh, six presentation today in this session so first of all i would like to invite uh, pradeep shamant from vidhanagar uh, college to uh, present her paper or to share her work with us so uh maybe i think is not there okay oh, then then ye jaan par 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 le bhai ho oh ye maaf kar dijiye me in my your ha maaf kar dijiye mute your microphone i think uh, she is Uh, absent so the next uh, presenter is kalan this thing yes please present yeah. please uh, please present your work thank you sir uh, first of all i would like to thank you to uh, the ranjan committee to going to this second this paper
Mr. Singh one request to you that if possible please make it shorter and if possible within 5 or 6 minutes try to finish. Sir, I have come but I can tell you in a... You can see the chat.
पर फूड परसेंट इन नॉर्मल व्हाट द डिक्रीज द 18.5 परसेंट वर सीड इज थ्री एंड फोर परसेंट आर सीड इज टू फोर पॉइंट फोर परसेंट वर सीड वन एंड सेवन पॉइंट थ्री परसेंट वर नॉर्मल इन दिस केस कंप्रोसाइज ऑफ फिफ्टी फोर परसेंट फोर पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट ऑफ चल्ड हुआ अंडर न्यूट्रिशन अंडर न्यूट्रिशन एंड वेयर इलेवन पॉइंट थ्री परसेंट वर हेल्थी whereas the among the richest 27.3 percent suffer from the malnutrition while 6.9 percent are healthy that is strong link uh, link between the under nutrition and education status this this research and the seed percentage in females is higher than the males this is my finding okay uh, thank you mr uh, kalinj singh uh, for sharing your valuable work on Social demographic profile and the prevalence of undernutrition among adult Bengali women uh, of Odisha district. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so, if you have any uh, queries, you can uh, share that queries with your chat because we are uh, running out of time. So, you can use uh, chat option for uh, sharing your or uh, for any queries or uh, suggestion or anything else. So, next, I would like to uh, request. Uh, Mr. Joy Ramtek to uh, present his work on align alignment, understanding bias, uh, perception on COVID-19 and vaccine uh, vaccine hesitancy. So please, Joy Ramtek. Uh, I think uh, he's absent. Uh, maybe. Oh. Okay. Okay. So the uh, next uh, presenter, Gina Wenbaum and Eudrom uh, Sujia Singh, and uh, their uh, paper is on COVID-19 pan pandemic lockdown, its impact on uh, mental health and activities of daily living among the youth. So uh, yes. please, uh, Mr. Singh. Hello. Yes. Sir, is my slide visible? It's audible. Okay, yeah, yeah, visible. visible. And I have a request that please try to make it shorter. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you. A very good evening to all. And in today's seminar, I'll be presenting on the topic COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, its impact on mental health and activities of daily living among the youths. Now, as we all have come across this dreadful virus, that is the coronavirus disease, which had been declared as a pandemic by the World Health Organization on 11th of March 2002. In the fight against this dreadful disease, people across the globe have been going through bitter experiences in all aspects of life, that is in social as well as domestic sphere. In India too, in order to prevent further spread of the virus, the government had imposed nationwide lockdown since 25th of March 2020, with restriction over the majority of commercial activities and mass gathering. As the lockdown proceeds, uh, where physical distancing is going on and due to its tremendous infections, the disease has inculcated a considerable degree of fear, worry, and concern in the population at large. Literatures regarding the present study reveals the psychological impact and change of behavior in the daily activities due to prolonged home stay. In this crisis situation of lockdown amid COVID-19 pandemic, there is a need to monitor the psychological impact, including the underlying mental health conditions and activities of daily living of the general public to reduce its impact in people's daily life in the present study and attempt was met to determine the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown on mental health and activities of daily living among the youths of Manipur. The study sample size was 279 out of which 70% were females and 30% males respectively. And the study population consists of youths aged 16 years and above in the population of Manipur who lived in their homes due to the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, an online survey was performed from 15 to 21st June 2020. It was a cross-sectional study regarding the statistical tool mean standard deviation and frequency percentage use. And a chi-square test was used to assess the significant association between the categorical variables then where a p-value less than 0 0.05 was considered to be statistically significant. Uh, these are the questions which was used in assessing the impact 
Participants were asked to complete general characteristic questions, questions regarding the negative mental health impacts resulting from the pandemic, and questions investigating on the impact on social and daily activities. Uh, in the first chart of the SX distribution, the maximum frequency is seen in the age range 24 to 25 years with 60.71% for male and 68.21% for female. Uh, and again, in the chart two regarding the educational status, males and females are not showing too much significant differences. And majority of the participants in the present study are in graduate and postgraduate. And now let us come to the occupational status. Most of the participants in the present study were students and there are some persons who are unemployed who belong to the private job and then government job with least frequency percentage. Here I focus on some core areas of the mental health. On the first table, we're finding significant differences when we compare between male and female with respect to the feeling of worriedness or anxious over infection or everyday uh, problems. In public mental health terms, rising rates of stress and anxiety is the main psychological impact to death, mainly during this period of isolation. For table two, regarding the feeling of frustration and helplessness, here there is no significant difference, we know that. But there are some difference between male and female as uh, we look uh, in the maximum part of the day. Here we find 8.33% in male, but in case of female, which is double, that is 16.41%. And table three is about the troubles faced by the participants regarding the sleep patterns. Here the females are found to have been impacted more than the males. However, the difference is not statistically significant. And in the fourth table of this slide shows that females feel more tired and have little energy than males at it. And the difference is found to be statistically significant. And the above two tables depicts individuals' experience in chains of eating habits and loss of interest in their regular daily activities. Uh, it is seen that females experience change in their eating habits than usual as compared to males and females are seen to lose more more interest or pleasure in their regular daily activities and in both the table the difference are found to be statistically significant. And the last two tables reveals that females were more depressed and sadder than males and have problems concerning uh, concentration on things due to the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. Here the difference is uh, not significant. Then the last table of the slide shows how the individuals spend most of their time during this lockdown. Uh, here, uh, the first table shows uh, how much uh, an individual participated in group action or mutual assistance in solidarity in helping others. And males are seen to have more participated than the females and the difference is found to be significantly, uh, statistically significant, sorry. Uh, here, the last two tables shows many variables, such as doing meditation or yoga, then doing something they are good at, then uh, eating, excess and so on. Here we find no signi statistical significance. However, we see the maximum in the social media dependence and doing something they are good at during the crisis pandemic. Uh, I skip the second table, that is uh, what they thought about staying home all day, where I put the variables boring, fun, crazy, half an etc. And uh, there's no much difference between males and the females in the boring. And when we talk about restlessness, we see much difference, even though it is not statistically significant. We see 8.33% for male and 16.92% for female. And during this crisis, people have been going through a lot of inconveniences and the present study revealed the impact on mental distress mainly among the female population due to the COVID-19 lockdown which found people to stay at home. Males are more participated in assisting others during the lockdown than females. Partic participation of individuals for a common cause may bring positive impact to the society where certain pandemic is going on. There is a need to take appropriate interventions based on the characteristic of the youth and adjustment in the daily activities for a healthier life and well-being during and after the pandemic. And one of the major limitations of the present study was cessation of the fieldwork and personal interview due to the 
due to this pandemic lockdown. And lastly, I would like to convey my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. H. Shurat Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Anthropology, for his supervision and immeasurable guidance in bringing up the present study. And my heartiest thanks to all the participants for their valuable contributions in the present study. And last but not the least, a very special thanks to all my friends for sharing the Google Forms, without which it will not be possible to collect all the data. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Gina. Thank you very much for sharing your uh, work on this important issue. Uh, so, if you have any observation and uh, suggestion, you can use uh, Google Chat option for that. Uh, because, uh, as you know, okay. so the next presentation is by uh, Thangjam Chitroleka Dev. And the topic is uh, maternal age and the risk of adverse pregnancy outcome. A very good afternoon to all. I am Thangjam Chitralekha Devi, not Thangjam Chitralekha Dev. And I am a research scholar in the Department of Anthropology, Manipur University. Today I am going to present on, on the title Maternal Age and Risk for Adverse Pregnancy Outcome. So, the maternal age is uh, defined as the age of the mother at the time of delivery, and age is an inherent risk for both the uh, mother and baby as they could experience problems either during pregnancy uh, or during birth or after birth. So, the various child-rearing ages are considered uh, at, a risk for adverse pregnancy outcome, and the mean age of childbearing of Indian women fell gradually from 28.75 years in 1975 to 27.4 years in 2020. And in India, about 20 to 30 percent of pregnancies belong to the high risk category, responsible for 75 percent of perinatal uh, morbidity and mortality. So both extreme of the childbearing age, which, which is uh, less than or equal to 17 years, and which are considered as teenage mother and uh, more than 35 years, which are considered as advanced maternal age, are considered at risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes. So the teenage mother faced higher risks of eclampsia, puberty, endometritis, and systemic infections during their pregnancy period. And furthermore, the newborn uh, born from the teenage mother can have higher risks of uh, low birth weight, uh, preterm uh, delivery, low upcard score, and severe uh, neonatal problems. Not only uh, teenage mother, advanced maternal age also, also give or also are responsible for maternal and fetal risks. So the advanced maternal age, which is greater than 35 years, there is a trend of delaying and delaying the pregnancy and childbearing age. And the childbearing age, delaying childbearing age is rising gradually, irrespective of race and economic, socioeconomic status. So in India, poor socioeconomic status, lack of contraceptive knowledge, religious issues, desire for the male child, the concept of a large family, these are the common causes of pregnancy with advanced maternal age. So pregnancy after the age of 35 years can be a challenge because of the maternal and fetal risks. So the complications associated with uh, such kind of uh, extreme ages includes risks of stillbirth, multiple births, gases, and diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, and increased risks of cesarean, cesarean births. So the objectives of the current study is to explore the prevalence and outcome of pregnancies conceived at extreme maternal ages. A cross-sectional study was conducted by carrying out household service to a simple random sampling technique, and a total of 393 uh, married women was collected. And the present study was carried out among the Maite women of Manipur, and the, so the population is Maite, Maite only. And the extreme maternal age was described as maternal age below 17 years and 37 years or older from the available clinical reports from the mother. And the reference age group was defined as mother who are pregnant between 18 and 30, 34 years of age. 
So the participants were categorized into uh, three groups according to their maternal age. One is less than or equal to 17 years, uh, second is 18 to 34 years, and third one is more than 35 years. So the adverse pregnancy outcome was defined as the occurrence of miscarriage, stillbirth, or birth before 30, uh, 37 weeks of gestation. And data were collected uh, on socioeconomic status, their socioeconomic status, pregnancy related hypertension disorders, and gestational diabetes during the pregnancy, and the mode of delivery, which uh, include this uh, fetal presentation, uh, mode of labor, and, and observe any neonatal uh, complications. So analysis of data was done on uh, SPSS uh, statistics version 25, and the study was approved by the Ethical Review Committee of Manipur University. So, so figure number one shows the proportion of the study population according to different age groups. 77.74 percent of women are in the reference category, 18 to 34 years, and 12.33 percent in the advanced maternal and age group, and 9.91 percent among the teenage age group. And the table number one shows the characteristic of the study population categorized by age group. Uh, the present study shows a uh, statistical significance difference among the different age groups. So in case of education, majority of the teenage mother were illiterate and high under high school, while majority of the uh, advanced maternal age mother were completed uh, higher secondary graduation and above. So in case of income, lowest income, uh, lowest income is seen among the teenage mother as compared to uh, the rest of the two age group. Moreover, both the extreme energy source, higher frequency of uh, pregnancy-related hypertension uh, disorder during their pregnancy, and gestational diabetes during pregnancy was uh, majorly reported among the teenage and the advanced maternal age group. And the table number two shows the level delivery and neonatal outcomes among the three age group. The abnormal fetal presentation uh, this induced more of labor and childbirth mode with caesarean section is reported highest among the advanced maternal uh, age group of women, while low birth weight and neonatal complications. Here, the neonatal complication includes the admission to the NICU or uh, the, or or the uh, neonates suffering from jaundice, these are included in this kind of complication. They were reported more among the teenage mother as, com uh, as compared to the uh, in this um, advanced maternal age group. In table number three, so is the prevalence of adverse pregnancy outcomes by maternal age group. The outcomes like miscarriage, abortion, and preterm birth were seen higher um, um, among the to extreme age group as compared to the mere reference age group. So from this present study, the maternal education level income and PRHD and gestational diabetes are significantly high in both, in both extreme maternal ages. Considering the studied populations, labor delivery and neonatal outcome, the abnormal fetal presentation, induced labor, cesarean section, low birth weight, and neonatal uh, complications or outcomes were significantly high among the extreme maternal age. Moreover, the prevalence of adverse pregnancy outcomes, including events like miscarriage, abortion, and preterm birth, was significantly high among the two, extra, uh, two uh, extreme maternal age group compared to the reference age group. The present finding confirms an adverse impact of extreme maternal age on pregnancy outcomes among the mighty women of Manipur. So the maternal care providers should carefully identify and inform women at higher risks of experiencing an uh, adverse pregnancy outcome in understanding potential uh, risks and optimize international care service for this uh, pregnant woman. The major limitation of my study is a small sample size, and second, the study could be more uh, meaningful, more pregnancy complications such as placenta previa, cervical dilation, uh, and also uh, some of these socioeconomic risk factors are also missing in my studies. So, if they all are included, then it will be more meaningful. So the present study being the first of its kind might raise uh, several important implications for uh, future research and other clinical practices. 
So the present uh, studies findings can identify the most significant risk factors of adverse pregnancy outcome to detect and implement uh, solutions for better quality outcomes in different population groups. And further research on maternal health should be carried out to refine the for and further uh, elaborate on the outcomes of the present study. I would like to thank all the individuals participated in the present study. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Daisy, uh, for sharing your uh, valuable work with us. So, the next and the last uh, presenter of this session is uh, Shudit Mal, and the topic is the emergence of modern child health care system, a analysis through Bengali uh, periodicals in late 19th and early 20th century. So, please, uh, Mr. Mal, you can share your work. Yes, sir. Uh, at first, I like to give thanks to the organizing committee for organizing this wonderful seminar and giving me a chance to present my paper. The name of my paper is the emergence of modern child care system and analysis through Bengali periodicals of late 19th and early 20th century. The wealth of a nation lays not so much in its economical and national resources, but it lies more decidedly in its children and youth. It is they who will be the creators and shapers of a nation's tomorrow. It therefore becomes mandatory for every nation and every society to nurture a strong, healthy and intellectual child. Philip P. Ellis argued in his book, Centuries of Childhood, that childhood is not a natural phenomenon, but a creation of society. It is a time in which one should have to take care of his diet, health and immunity. The government of health in the uh, government of India has acknowledged this fact and has started several reform projects like early childhood care and education, Swagosika, Ovijan and so on. Throughout the paper I discussed how child care began to get special importance in the late 19th and early 20th century colonial Bengal. Why did this happen? Also, how much does it affect the society? Before going to this main discussion, I will highlight the tradition of childcare in India through a brief analysis of Ayurvedic medical text for a better understanding of the changing method of childcare in the late colonial period. Children in Ayurveda. In common terms, childhood is considered to start from birth, but historians, sociologists, and anthropologists have suggested that there is no single and universal experience or understanding of what childhood is and where it begins and ends, but that this has altered according to time and place. Here, the French scholar Philip A. in his book, Centuries of Childhood, first assumed that in Europe, ancient societies did not have a clear representation, a clear mental representation of the child. Before the 17th century, children were viewed as skinny adults. They had no special clothing, food, social, a social space or time which amounted to a childhood culture. 15th and 16th centuries European paintings highlighted that uh, children's cloth and their bodily proportion are the same as those of adults. But in Indian tradition, it was something different. One of the eight branches of Ayurveda discussed the health care and development of children. The chapter entitled Kumara Rastra in Chorok and Sutta Samhita also gives importance to child care. According to Indian tradition medical text, the development of a child begins from conception, not from birth. Moreover, they consider birth as the end of the first stage of the life cycle, rather than its beginning. So they give, give special emphasis on the prenatal period for the physical and mental development of the child. So a large proportion of the Ayurvedic literature discussed observations and speculations on fetal development. According to Ayurvedic tradition, the desire of a pregnant woman are considered as the desire of the fetal. The Ayurvedic texts have wide-ranging instruction on various topics such as the time when a child should be encouraged to sit up or the specification of toys concerning color, size, Shape and texture, but most of this is unacceptable from the scientific point of view. Also, it was present not to awaken the children suddenly from sleep, not to force them to eat, etc. So, it is needless to say, children had a special position in our traditional society, which is different from traditional European society. But this traditional view began to change from the late 19th century based on new scientific medical knowledge. 
which was also different from Europe. Chinese and colonial Bengal. After the end of the 17th century in Europe, the child stopped living with the adults and learning how to work from them. The parents also became very fond of their children's education and healthcare. As a result, the family began to organize itself around the children. The social value of children was affected by the major economic transformation in the society of Europe. The shift from the agricultural economy to an industrialized economy in the 19th century. Children were no longer seen as economic requirements after the industrial revolution. But the Indian context was something different. From the early 19th century, European Christian missionary schools began to write books for children. Writing about science for children was begun by Europeans, but Indians uptake it quickly. In the late 19th century, rigidly structured and extended childhood for the first time was introduced in colonial Bengal. Changed social conditions forced them to make such type of decisions. A large number of new middle class people emerged in this period, which created competition for government jobs among middle class children. So there was a necessity for the intellectual development of these children, which will prepare them for the competition. This is why a large number of juvenile magazines like Sokha, Sati, Balo, Mukul, Sondes, and others were published in this period, which contained ideal biographies, charming stories, essay articles on science and history. After all, the aim was Swarbangi Sikha, not only intellectual development, but healthy children also became obligated for the future development of India. Colonial and nationalist representation of childcare were fused with the question of community and national health. And wealthy. But childhood is a period of development and dependency. So their health and well-being are greatly dependent on their family members, especially on their mother. Therefore, several writings began to publish from the late 1880s on scientifically based child care, which was mostly access to the middle class women. Hadro Moyle, Allopathy, Physician, Bonkar Posa, Mukhabata, in his very popular book, Access. To the educated Bongo Moila, entitled Masti Sikha or the Gorbavasta or Sutika Gay Mata Evo, Balavasta Porto, the Santane, Sastro Kabisa Kupos. It highlights the significance of following a well disciplined life before and after child, but to ensure health and comfort to mother, mother and infant. Not only books, various periodicals like Children's Chikita Sommeloni, Chikisa or Somalocho, Griostani, Mamabodi Postika, and others began to publish articles on how to nurture infant, how to deliver healthy child, how to treat children during their illness, advice matter about the symptoms and basic medicines for illness. Uh, in an article entitled Bio Chikisa Mama Mosini Postika mentioned that like other education women need to know some medical education as it was not easy and useful to call doctor for all ailments. If they call doctors for some disease of their own and their children, there was a possibility of death or harm instead of benefit. In another article entitled Follows Biochikista, this uh, journal advised their readers that how to deal with the own disease of their children. Also another example is from Biochikista, which suggests to their readers how to deal with the situation if their children fall from the tree or roof. These types of various articles advise mothers about the primary remedies for cholera, fever, malaria, and so on. For the well-being of children, some of the articles want mothers about the bad effect of raw milk, artificial milk, and suggested breastfeeding or boiling, which is hygienic for children. Also, some articles suggested a hygienic and scientific method of midwifery practice, which is necessary for the well-being of maternity and infant. In this way, being media tries to spread awareness among women for the health care of the children and other family members. Moreover, the Victoria Memorial Scholarship Fund suggested awareness campaigns among the mothers for the improvement of conditions of maternity and infant care. They try to spread awareness among women through the lectures and instructed girls and boys in primary schools, prepare lectures for mothers in the class. Schools organized women, journals, baby shows, simple book on antenatal care. Hence, child care becomes an important issue in society since the last quarter of the 19th century. It has a great significance in colonial society. By this motherhood and child care, were gradually became scientific, modern, and medicalized issues that required education, scientific knowledge, and skills. And Mr. Time, Mr. Time, Mr. Time, huh? yeah, uh, please, yes. please try to make it a little smaller. Okay. Just only two or three minutes. 
uh, and interestingly, most most of the awareness campaigns were middle class, semi-educated, bhadra mohila centric. So educated women became necessary for modern scientific based challenge. It began to distinguish between the child rearing method of illiterate and uh, illiterate and illiterate women. Therefore, the modern scientific based child rearing method gradually became an identity of middle class people when illiterate families, especially mothers, were stuck in the traditional method of child care. It also affected the uh, mentality and future of the children. Moreover, it started to create an invisible wall between poor and rich children. Surprisingly, proper childcare became a necessary duty for middle class women, which made them more attached to the domestic world. Conclusion. So I can conclude that female education became necessary in the late colonial period for the well-being of their family members, especially for their children who will make the future of India. In this way, child care became an important issue in the late 19th and early 20th century colonial period, which gradually affected the society. It changed the role of middle class children in society. Now they have a duty on national level with family maintenance. Uh, even today, we are attached to this fact after colonial statement, executive direct of family and community health world health organization said in 2002 that uh, mortality rates among newly born children remain high in many countries because mothers lack care during pregnancy and childbirth and babies who are receive essential newborn care each year more than 10 million children die before their fifth birthday. Most of them suffer from respiratory tract infection, diarrhea, malaria, and infectious arising at birth. Lack of access to healthcare and inadequate education, particularly in girls and women, are also important matters with malnutrition for the death of children. All of these states are more tragic because they are immediately avoided. So we need to focus awareness and be among poor illiterate women. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ma, for sharing your important work. And this, is, this was the last presentation. So I would like to thank you all for your uh, participation, sharing your important presentation, and careful listening. And thank you all. And now I would like to over to, it, uh, to the organizer for the next session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jyoti Ratan Ghosh, uh, for a nicely organized uh, this session and chairing this session. And uh, uh, in this session, uh, we have the four speakers. And one is talking about the socio-demographic profile, and another is on the impact of the mental health, and another on the mental age on the pregnancy outcomes. And uh, last one was the review uh, uh, health care systems uh, from the various periodicals. Thank you all uh, for nicely present presentations, uh, their papers. And uh, thank you very much uh, to Dr. Jyoti Ratan Ghosh again. Uh, now I like to uh, go to the next session. Uh, before go to the next sessions, uh, I invite Dr. Shudi Bhui um, for uh, chairing these sessions. And before going to the head of work, I like to brief here about himself. Uh, Dr. Shudi Bhui is an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Anthropology and Tribal Studies of Shido Kano Visha University. Uh, he has a double MSc and MPhil PhD degree. And uh, before joining the Department of Anthropology and uh, Tribal Studies in Shidu Kano Vishwa University, uh, he served as an assistant professor in the Anthropology Department of Mohishadal Girls College. Uh, he has also taught uh, at the Uldia Government College. Uh, Dr. Bhui is the principal and co-principal investigator of the, a number of ongoing research projects. Uh, he has published uh, numerous research articles in both the national and international level, peer-reviewed academic journals. Uh, he also has quit a few books and book chapters uh, to his credit. Uh, he has also made presentations of his research at a good number of international seminars and conferences. Uh, his areas of specializations include social anthropology, uh, tribal ethnography, uh, folklore, uh, ethnomedicine, indigenous healthcare systems. Uh, such an eminent person uh, is going to chair these sessions. Welcome, sir. Uh, sir, uh, in these sessions, uh, we have the six paper presentations. Uh, uh, please, uh, 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 I like to invite you uh, for chairing these sessions. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, very much warm welcome to all of you, uh, distinguished uh, scholars and learned personnel. 
and i am very much thankful to have a chance to chair this session uh, actually this uh, session is a virtual home feeling to me because uh, seva bharati mahavidyalaya is my undergraduate college and also my colleague uh, dr devaprasad sahu he is the principal of this college and is ex colleague of mine in moisada girls college also and my classmate and my ex colleagues are also here so it is a virtual home feeling to me and now this is a very long session of three days international webinar on anthropology of epidemics organized by department of anthropology and iqac seva bharati mahavidyalaya kapgari chhatra and collaborate with department of anthropology shukumar shankar mahavidyalaya pushti medni and i also thank to professor deepak kumar goya principal shukumar shankar mahavidyalaya pushti medni pur and the uh, organizers especially ms ruby adar konda dr orun mojumdar and dr shantanu konda and uh, so uh, in continuing this uh, with the last session uh, dr jyoti rathan ghosh uh, which also very familiar relationship uh, to me and i am thankful to him also and we have six papers uh, from different corners of our country delhi chhattisgarh and nagpur and the three papers consist of the covid related situation in varsha trial ground and others from other health related issues like autism and ethnomedicinal so i again welcome to my participants in this session and uh, and request to getting cooperation from all of you and uh, let uh, come uh, to give the participant to very good session now may i request to um, mr sumon maithi uh, mphil student of vidyasagar university uh, who with his uh, research article an anthropological study on the impact of covid-19 pandemic on tourism in coastal new delhi uh, mr maithi please uh, please uh, all participants uh, i am requesting to you uh, please take 5 minutes for your presentation because uh, we will have a time constraint and uh, try to give your uh, most important findings and uh, outlook uh, through your participation uh, mr mike please suman maiti is there okay uh, okay Yes, uh, okay, I have learned. This morning, my T is now here. So, uh, the next presenter, uh, Mr. Mohesh Sundarpal, research scholar of Anthropological Survey of India. Now he is uh, involved with CRC Nagpur. Uh, so, Mr. Paul, please welcome to present your paper, Mr. Paul. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Namaskar. Hello. Uh, you are audible yes yeah. oh okay thanks yes please uh, uh my topic uh, is uh, ethnomedicinal investigation on medicinal plant used to treat fever among the tribes of bajaj forest in the central india uh, uh first is uh, what is ethnomedicine ethnomedicine is a sub field of medical anthropology that deal with the study of traditional medicine not only those that have relevant written source but especially those whose knowledge and practices have been orally transmitted ethnomedicine is concerned with the cultural interpretation of health disease and illness and it also addresses the healthcare seeking process uh this is the relationship with anthropology and ethnomedicine uh ethnomedicine is a borderline uh, topic yeah. Uh, Mr. Paul, please uh, you uh, work for the your the conceptual paper and or theoretical background. Yes. Please come in specific your article and okay. findings, please. Okay. Okay. Plants to be done. Now, okay. Uh, my uh, some uh, recent pathologies are uh, sorry. Uh, sampling or uh, observation uh, interviewing fgd so next next uh, uh, 
जो इस डिंडोरी डिस्ट्रिक्ट में मेरे जो काम है जो बजाब फॉरेस्ट रेंज है वहाँ पे ये मेरी स्टडी हुई है बजाब फॉरेस्ट एंड बजाब फॉरेस्ट रेंज इस सस्पेंडेड इन नेशनल पार्ट ऑफ डिंडोरी डिस्ट्रिक्ट The aim of present investigation mainly focused on literary traditional knowledge on medicinal plants used to treat fever in tribal inhabitants of Bajab forest range of Dindori district, Madhya Pradesh. The Dindori district of Madhya Pradesh is a tribal district. Baga, Gold, Coal, Pradhan are major tribes of the district. It has been shown that the various medicinal herbs used by the tribes of the study area for the treatment of fever in order to collect authentic data in the civil ministry. तो जो मेरा फर्स्ट है गुरबेल जो इसका यूज है जो इसकी लीव्स हैं उसको भी यूज करते हैं बुखार के लिए तो फीवर में और साथ ही साथ जो बोन फीवर है मलेरिया फीवर के और बोन फीवर दोनों में इसका इस्तेमाल करते हैं पालिन तो इसको है होल पार्ट्स ऑफ पालिन प्लांट्स आज यूज इन मलेरिया फीवर एंड आल्सो बोन फीवर द रूट ऑफ बड़ी इंद्रावन यूजफुल इन मलेरिया द रूट ऑफ धतुरा यूज इन फीवर द प्लांट ऑफ सफेद अकवन यूज इन फीवर द बेर इट्स बार्क डेकोटेशन यूज फॉर ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ फीवर लीव एंड पार्क ऑफ सोरियन अवस्था इज यूजफुल इन फीवर द खमार फ्लावर्स आर यूज इन फीवर द डेकोटेशन पार्क ऑफ रोजिना इज गिवेन विद द वाटर फॉर द ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ इंटरमेट फीवर तो सब लोकल पीपल ऑफ दिस एरिया मेनली बैगा Have so knowledge of how so government can seek their help in training for training the people in attention and collection of herbs, curing diseases and using herbs. Ah, uh, just some suggestions. Hai. So documentation of knowledge of traditional healing must be done by more people so that valuable knowledge of healers can be conceptualized and preserved, and people can extract benefit from the knowledge around the globe. Intellectuals are openly invited to test the medicinal data collected by researchers in labs, or can compare it with secondary data to prove the scientific approaches behind the claims made by the tribal. It also provides the importance of anthropology in modern drug discovery. Thanks. Uh, okay, uh, good presentation uh, by Mr. Paul, and uh, now. Um, I also request participants to like in chat box uh, through your interaction for this research article. And uh, now may I request uh, to Mr. Devashish Shaw, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Sukumar Sengupta Mahavidyalaya, uh, with his uh, novel research article, When Things Fall Apart: Role of Pandemic Literature of the First in Recent COVID-19 Crisis. Uh, I am sure uh, this will give you uh, another. Test, Mr. Shaw, please. Am I audible, sir? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. All right. Respect to chairperson and all the participants and and the listeners. Uh, good evening. Uh, I have a, a prepared a paper on pandemic literature. I have titled my paper "When Things Fall Apart: Role of Pandemic Literature of the Past in Recent COVID-19 Crisis." And things fall apart is is taken from a, a, a famous poem by a modern poet, the Second Coming, and he talks about how human reacts on the on the situation of adversity. And uh, first of all, it, it's very clear that now we are thinking about the role of humans in this in this pandemic situation. Not before that, the studies of anthropocene and human behavior, uh, and these kind of seminars are happening all over the world for for this kind of reason. 
So when I when I see the literature of the past, when 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 I talk about firstly talk about the the bloody boundaries of literature and anthropology, uh, we can we can find we can we can start with the with the themes of the the Gadi president when when in 1947 the president of American Anthropological Association, Ruth Benedict talks about the the, the in, uh, relationship between anthropology and literature. He talks she talks about that. And that both both the both the branches of study talks about the same thing. It's, it's a man, his work, his life, his ideas, his history, and and both uh, are similar in their too. And when uh, furthering his uh, her, 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 her argument, he he talks about that uh, the importance of Shakespeare in her life. He, she talks that uh, when I never knew nothing about anthropology, I was very much attracted by Shakespeare. When I learned Shakespeare, I actually become an anthropologist. So literature is, is just kind of a kind of a branch. Literature is often understood as one of the anthropologist's most recurrent and provocative companies. And through this uh, through this idea, I have I have kind of prepared my uh, uh, paper uh, to to, un to understand what is the role. Of, of pandemic literature in the mental life and in, in not only mental life in every sphere of our life. For example, it, talk, it, it works as a catharsis. It talks about uh, how we can uh, relate our our uh, uh, recent situation to, with the past pandemic. For example, um, for this study, I have uh, I have chosen uh, too many texts, but I am going to uh, sort it uh, because of time. Uh, I have uh, I am going to uh, present my paper on Daniel Defoe's The Journal of the Plague Year, Albert Camus' The Plague, and of course one uh, important uh, movie that came in uh, 2011 that is called Contagion, which we can see in Netflix. Uh, so uh, through these texts, through these three texts and one movie. Uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to pay, uh, present my paper how uh, these kind of uh, pandemics already happened earlier and we have somehow learned from it or somehow not learned from it, uh, but it, it uh, kind of works as a kind of therapeutic uh, uh, way to live our modern life. For example, when we talk about Daniel Defoe's uh, 1720 novel Journal of the Plague Year, which is based on the Great Plague that was London in 1665, uh, it talks about how we are very much uh, very influenced by this kind of uh, uh, fatal uh, pandemic. For example, Defoe traces here the mental ills of the citizens very explicitly. For example, various segments of the society have reacted differently from this situation. For example, the rich fled from the place to protect themselves. The poor had to take up jobs from others, from Nazis, nursing the uh, people, from watchmen and other things. And it has not affected only one, one sphere of the society. It has, it has affected the downtrodden also. It has, it, has, it has affected middle classes also. It has affected higher class also. And before here uh, document people's minds, they are guided by religious beliefs. For example, one character there, uh, especially the narrator who believed in God. If he says that the plague is created by God and God will actually save us from there. But the idea of, this, of believing in God, God is not a problem. The problem is that, that we believe sometimes that some uh, 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 unknown thing, some, some divine intervention, some supernatural event, some astrological thing, some prediction would actually cure our mind. The before here wants to talk about that, the, the, the problem is created by the human. The problem is created by the human and the solve, the, 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 the solvement of, the, of these problems can be done with only by the human. We can, we can dream about something. We can write there. I quote, treat these things so that how far people were really overcome with delusion. The people, the humans are actually deluded by the, by this, the concept of the human. We can, we can understand, we can understand the next story, which is Albert Cover's The Plague, where he focuses on a virus, which, which is, which is not actually a real virus, it's a kind of imaginary virus, but he talks about how women's reaction to the situation. First, they deny it. That they, they, they are they are not acknowledging that they are actually uh, the, the most insignificant creature in this whole wide world. If you think about the universe, we are just just like an like, like an ant. So we first at the time when when it, it breaks down, we actually try to deny. It. We, we we try to give reasons to this disease. But we always forget that these 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 diseases are created by humans. It it, it will last. Of course, we we always. 
uh, give us a kind of sense, false sense of uh, b b b importance that this will end, this will end just like other pandemic. But the problem is that it kind of uh, affects our mind in a broad way. Uh, for example, the novel uh, puts forward the psyche and the mental state of the protagonist with the doctor. He sees that there is there is dead dead people coming here. Uh, he, he is he is dealing with so many um, uh, problems in in the society. He is, he, this is this is a kind of endless defeat for him. And uh, the play, with which Albert Camus' novel is, is talks about a description of the cholera, is that the society is closing gates, society closing gates for the un underprivileged. They are the ones who are afraid of the others. The people are becoming afraid of the people. Uh, the humans are becoming afraid of the humans. So this this kind of fear, this kind of uh, mental condition, the, the constant sir, fear of sir, the please, please come in your summary, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Last, yes. last one. I'm just giving one minute, right? So this kind of uh, 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 false kind of um, uh, 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 sense of uh, uh, importance in, of humans in our life, it has kind of a uh, adverse effect on our day-to-day -day life. On the last uh, 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 text I'm going to talk about is that actually is a Portuguese text which is written by Jose uh, Saramago, that is called Blindness, which was published in 1995. It talks about the metaphor of blindness. And it's a story where a man becomes suddenly blind, and uh, you can see that where, where, wherever he goes, and where, whenever he meets a person, uh, and that person becomes blind. So blindness becomes a kind of pandemic in that situation. So this, this, is a, this is the main idea of this of my paper, that we are kind of a blind. We, we are blinded by human rationality. We are, we are blinded by human behavior. We are blinded by human understanding. The, the problem of this, uh, the, the, of this behavior is that it, it actually uh, blinds our, our uh, uh, understanding of human life. Human life is, 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 is a kind of, uh, uh, one of one of the most important observations that I have made from this text is that it normalizes this kind of blindness. Blindness to the pollution, blindness to the, uh, the, the uh, simple things we do, do in life. So blindness, no question, is, 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 a, is, a, is a kind of uh, 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 created, it's not created by the pandemic. Blindness is created by, by us, by the humans. So uh, uh, this, uh, lastly, I'm going to end my paper with this thing that we are not going to accept our fate like this. If we want to change our fate, we want to, we want to stop this cycle of pandemic because this pandemic will not end. This is a cycle. This will not wipe out the humanity. This will not end the human forever from this world. But if we want to uh, close this cycle, cycle of, of pandemic which is coming ever, ever, ever again and which will again come in the latter part of our century. But if we want to, we want to actually um, abolish this kind of pandemic from future, uh, we have to think about ourselves. We have to think about our human action. So this pandemic takes this pandemic literature of the past talks about that how we can we can deal with the present situation of COVID-19 crisis and and this pandemic literature I think in my way that it it, it actually works as a as a therapeutic way and it talks about the catharsis which 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 is very important to actually keep our mental state as well as our physical state in in in, in, in a particular way. Uh, so this is thank you. Uh, I, I could have told much more. I need to. Uh, share my thoughts in the chat box. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Shao, uh, thank you. And you have the chance uh, through interaction through our chat box uh, with the participants and followers. And uh, you give us a good uh, research journey from literature to anthropology and the voyages with uh, linked with the cholera and plague. And also you give some uh, glimpses uh, of good feelings with God and life to life in pandemic situation. Blind faith. So again, thank you. Yes. And thank now you. I welcome uh, Ms. Lifika Nath, a research scholar, uh, Department University of Delhi. Ms. Nath. Hello. Continue Hello. Good evening to all of you. Am I audible properly? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, my greetings to the respected professors present over here and uh, my greetings to all the paper presenters and distinguished speakers. And of course, uh, my greetings to all over here, all are presenting over here. And uh, I would like to uh, share my screen first. So let me share my screen. Okay. 
Okay, please let me know. Is it visible? Is it visible? Hello. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Talking about impact of COVID-19 pandemic on communication and behavior pattern, uh, which is supposed to be an anthropological understanding. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that you know uh, we have uh, learned much about what has been the impact uh, of COVID-19 pandemic, particularly to our physical health and all. And extending to the uh, that uh, humans are the creators of the problems, and of course we are the ultimate solver of the things. So uh, communicate communication and behavior, as we know, the communication is of you know process of uh, how we exchange information within us, and it is of course the only way to manage the you know manage any kind of things. So communication and behavior, both the things are intermingly concepts. And in this paper, I, I have particularly uh, tried to understand the important sources of impact of, of course, COVID-19 pandemic, and also the journey of living in a new communication tradition. Uh, uh, of course, that is the transformation from you know, face to face communication uh, to the online platforms and all the consequences and management of new normal situations, social facts in terms of inter, intra and mass communicative behavior. And all these things that I have tried to understand in a term, uh, in a basis of the family level that is supposed to be the you know, this, uh, unit of the society. And everything that we start is, of course, from the family uh, of, uh, it itself. So my objectives of the study was uh, to understand how the intra and inter-family communication pattern have been reshaped within family and the social level. The second one was what are the advantages and disadvantages of space are taking other people to cope up with the pandemic situation and the third one was the what is the role of social or digital media platforms in the life of people while dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic of course along with its pros and cons. Now wide area uh, array of theoretical approaches has been taken care of and uh, those are really much you know uh, emerging out today in, uh, in today's time and of course the first one is the resilience or the coping strategies uh, maintenance of management, maintenance and management of the risks, rituals and routines, dependent care in terms of both elder and child care, the right to the elderly, homeschooling and working from home are of course the two of the most emerging uh, concepts uh, over here. New social media information, health literacy in the family, work-life balance division of labor, physical detachment, and psychological separation, and last but not the least about the concept of privacy issues. And uh, this particular study will actually aim to enhance our anthropological understanding of the evolutionary way and the adaptive mechanism of communicative behavior in respect to both of our physical and of, of course our social culture dimension. If I just quickly go to my methodology, so as I use the cross-sectional descriptive study over here, I used stratified cluster sampling that is supposed to be a, a, a random sampling and uh, the sample size was you know, 30, 32 members has been interviewed. I tried to understand this particular context in a in a semi-urban um, area that is Bhaluka under the district of 24 PGs north in West Bengal. Uh, oral consent has been conducted before interview. And for data, data collection, I try to uh, incorporate semi-structured in-depth interview in the field. And uh, for a few of the participants, I use telephonic interview. And for the analysis, I use thematic analysis, interpretive approach to which I drawn my conclusions. And on the ultimate, I found it a theory which is grounded in my data. So the primary goals of my analysis was supposed to be adaptive strategies, acknowledgement to the regrets in terms of whatever, you know, whatever communicative behavior we had in terms of both positive and negative actions. Supportive actions were also being seen. New, uh, new initiatives were also being very prominent over here. Transformation of communication pattern, which is, of course, from transforming to the face-to-face, -to, -face, to the online platform, to the digital media, to social media chattings and all. Uh, physical discomfort and mental discomfort both are of course related to all these hassles, all these management, risk management things. Uh, adjustive struggle was very much in terms of, you know, in terms of workloads, managing our school routines, managing our daily work tasks and so on and so forth. 
and of course the diversity in mindsets was you know one was the something that helped us to manage the issues that we have you know we have faced over the days in a more precision way so uh, the major themes of my study was transformation that i found from my data was first of all transformations in terms of communication media behaviors and awareness and habits discomforts in terms of physical behavioral and psychological issues that is very prominent adaptive mechanism in terms of managing daily routines following communication measures in terms of you know using sanitizer hand sanitizer frequently using masks for all the time and so on and so forth then self awareness was something that has been very prevalent over the days acknowledgments have been found out in terms of uncertainty yeah we of course we acknowledge that yeah our life is now in an uncertain position we don't know what is going to happen in the next day regrets of unexpected behaviors were also supposed to be seen and of course depressiveness was something that has been very prevalent then supportive actions supportive actions in terms of enjoyment planning planning uh, both in terms of family level and if it is not possible if it is for friends and you know, other colleagues and all we just try to make it possible through online platforms so it is all about virtual virtual celebration and then comes reminding duties and cooperation which is the ultimate source of the management uh, ultimate strength uh, to manage our daily lives in this critical situation and the last but not the least the new initiatives that has been taken like uh, transformation in habits donation and voluntary works and plantation and gardening not limited to these but there are so many like digital businesses and marketings and all that also have been prominent over here last but not least i would like to draw my conclusion in the sense that sudden life lifestyle transformations and discomforts are the major issues that the families were facing due to the change in the communicative behavior in the time in this particular time but by acknowledging their faults taking up new initiatives adapting strategies and through supportive actions for one another they are now coping up with the pandemic situation in respect to communicating within family within you know within others like friends colleagues relatives and to the ultimate society and physical proximity to emotional bonding was found to be as a modified communication framework and behavioral strategy at the end of my study uh and lastly i would just like to quote one line by that is you know that is by my uh, guru professor pc joshi that whatever you know distancing we are having it of course should be physical one instead of the social distancing thank you so much and any kind of questions and queries will be welcomed thank you so much uh, thank you ma'am very good presentation and it is very time for the uh, findings uh, for communication and communicative the problem and get the solution for pan covid pandemic and thank you, sir. Thank you so much. i also request you to stay in chat box for the participants questions and other queries for development of your research article and paper yes sir uh, sure now sure. Yes, ma'am. Now I may welcome to Dr. Shuman Kollan Samanto, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of Anthropology, Morshadal Girls College. Uh, which is the topic health profile of the Lohars, prospects and problems study at the rural areas of West Medinipur district. Dr. Samanto, please. Good evening to everybody. Am I audible, sir? Yes. Hello. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, thank you to everybody, and thank you to chairperson. And uh, he is also my uh, chair, the ex head of the department of my department. Uh, now I will start uh, my paper. Uh, share my screen. Uh, this is. Uh, the my paper a health profile of the Lothar prospects and problems study at the rural areas of Medinipur district. Uh, for the Lothars, they are one of the most important, uh, particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Those who are now living in the post Medinipur and associated areas, and uh, earlier they are addressed as the criminal tribe. Now they are addressed as the denotified tribe or Bimoktu Bharati Goshti. And uh, I have conducted uh, the study on the Two villages uh, that is Kajla and Paruliya, 
and it is the ultimate outcome of a departmental field work of my department and uh, the two uh, i have only already uh, considered the both primary and secondary data sources and uh, relevant secondary materials also considered for this study uh, methods used uh, schedule questionnaire uh, schedule uh, case studies genealogy constructed interviews uh, direct observations and uh, focus group discussions also considered with due importance uh, photographic methods also and both qualitative and quantitative data also studied with due importance and, uh, and uh, descriptive analysis also given some importance uh, food habits and nutritional conditions uh, they take uh, the boiled rice and uh, other staple food twice in a daily and uh, take tiffin once in a daily and uh, they uh, take another another uh, staple foods like rice vegetables spinach and um, other materials they mainly collect uh, collected food earlier from the forest but now they shift it to the locally available foods and market available foods and uh, one matter is that uh, to collect the rice and wheat they now it is uh, depending on the government rationing system 72% uh, um, child they belongs to the underweight category and uh, it is one of the interesting matter is that 86.57% families belong belongs to the landless category and only 8.2% families they have purchased land and when considered to the sanitary and trade system 42.59% uh, families have a service household have the sanit uh, sanitary households that means the toilets but uh, among these households 15.7% used these toilets and uh, due to some uh, reasons like uh, not uh, have any water resources and uh, bad condition of toilets they don't use um 84.25% uh, cases they did not use these toilets and especially they uh, prefer to the adult they prefer to use these uh, open places in the night time for the toilets and uh, the children they also prefer to open places for this purpose in case of uh, water facilities earlier they used the uh, well water and uh, uh, pond water for the drinking purposes but now almost 100% families use the tube well uh, and uh, deep tube well water for the drinking purposes and uh, 77% uh, families uh, they um, take the uh, same water for the drinking and the household purposes and 12% uh, families they use the uh, concept of, they have the concept of a purification either ashram sanctum or alum or bleaching powder or um, halogen tablets provided by the local sub, uh, local health center and uh, at the same time 61 percent families they don't use any uh, purification measures in case of disease profile i saw that the, the communicable and non-communicable both are seen and uh, dengue malaria is uh, prevalent in these areas and uh, season wise different uh, diseases also very much prevalent and the six percent uh, cases uh, the tumor cases is very prevalent 15 percent cases they suffer from asthma and lung problem and 18 percent cases uh, they suffer from liver problem because uh, in comparison to other communities uh, among the lotha family uh, lotha family or lotha community the liquor intake or the consum consumption of li uh, liquor is much more hey, this is my personal observation also and this is the diagrammatic representation and i come to another point the receiving of treatment uh, 33 percent of treatment uh, they received from uh, village health center earlier i told that uh, the village uh, health person they told that nobody come to their uh, receive their treatment from the, the centers but uh, gradually they motivated and uh, still 38 but 38 percent people depending on the quarks and uh, four percent uh, go to the private practitioner but it is not the last option uh, to them due to the massive economic crisis and uh, low people in 25 percent cases go to the traditional medicinal uh, medicine men or ayurvedic centers now uh, ayurvedic specialist or, or or exorcist or others and uh, in cases ayurvedic or indigenous treatment failed then they go to quarks 
and if they fail then they go to hospitals if they fail then they go move to private sectors and it is the another observation yeah, another observation of our study and when uh, they receive the medicine so what is bleaching halogen from the sub center or hospital but they uh, don't use properly due to lack of consciousness or illiteracy and uh, um mainly depending on their traditional systems and uh, they nowadays they uh, gradually motivated to allopathic and homeopathic uh, systems and uh, narangod is a uh, quite market place and uh, villagers now exposed to the modern medical facilities and come in contact with the modern facilities and ultimately uh, they sometimes impress them and uh, to some extent in competition to the earlier times and uh, uh, Tendin, they have a tendency to treat the patient and purchase medicines uh, from the private sectors uh, is also a very slowly increasing tendency day by day and it occurs due to the uh, limitations of the governmental health systems and this is the scenario i present here and addiction pattern uh, from, from my personal observation uh, it is i, I have seen that uh, among the lotha people the addiction pattern is quite much more in comparison to the local other tribal communities and they intake um, higher amount of uh, liquor tobacco uh, betel leaf and uh, hadia and something others mohul and something others and government facilities uh, as uh, any forts in the eyes of the villagers malaria leprosy tb and other diseases uh, treated carefully uh, this is the opinion of the villagers within their limited capacity many hospital staffs and uh, uh, examine in different ways and uh, try their best especially in the treatment of above mentioned diseases they provide tablets halogens and uh, such and such materials local village health center also takes an important role especially as a part of the treatment and immunization local icu center provides some amount of nutritious foods to them and uh, sometimes doctor themselves remain in the remain present in the sub centers to check up the health conditions and uh, the suspectation uh, sometimes the villagers suspect the government uh, services like Uh, early at the villagers were not at all interested in the immunization of the children due to phobia illiteracy misconception or governmental uh, laziness uh, few villagers suspect that government uh, supplied medicines are of low quality than the market available medicines uh, few villagers uh, viewed that uh, uh, government supplied medicines are not so functioning well and a few villagers supported that that means the aged villagers supported that the traditional medicines are better than the government medicines and uh, government medicines are bitter in taste and odd in smell and uh, hatch probably facing by the villagers uh, illiteracy it is a very um, big problem to them and uh, another sir, problem sir, is please, the, uh, sir, uh, last, la, last last slide sir uh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, adopted uh, the year to adopt any different uh, uh, occupation and many times they cannot tell uh, this disease or symptoms properly and uh, no health uh, treatment and the distance uh, from nearest hospital it is also uh, against of them and uh, the miscommunication with the government officials and uh, and like that and uh, hardly they go tend to go to the specialist or private medical doctors for high cost and few governmental uh, personnel have uh, not whole hearted uh, like this thanking you for giving me the time uh, okay sir okay uh, thank you dr samanto uh, for your research endeavor and uh, we came to know and uh, scenario healthcare scenario of lot of people of our pushim manipur and west bengal Uh, now may i request uh, mr ushin bajrang uh, for presentation of his paper he is coming from so school of social science uh, pandit ravi shankar shukla university raipur chatisgarh and he's come with burden of diarrhea on the basis of annual health survey report and local news media mr bajrang please Sir, I think uh, he is absent. Okay, okay. Uh, now may I request uh, Mr. Sumon Maithi? He is waiting for his presentation uh, because uh, in first uh, time he was absent. 
and uh, Mr. Sumon Maiti, Jamfil students of Vidya Sagar University Department of Anthropology, and he is coming with uh, an, an anthropological study on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on tourism in coastal New Guinea. Very interesting paper, Mr. Maiti. Yes, Hello, sir. Is my slides are visible? Yes, yes. Please continue. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for giving me an opportunity to present my topic. My topic is an anthropological study on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on tourism in coastal New Diga. Here it is my con content. As an introduction, traveling is the most entertaining way to meet strangers and explore new places if the route is free of illness, crime, and catastrophe. The COVID-19 pandemic is one of a lifetime experience for everyone on all, where everyone on the world has affected to the same degree as COVID-19. However, the government announced the tourist parts uh, of India, including hotel lodges, uh, restaurants, and local shops of the tourist spots would be closed for the pandemic started in 2019. The remedies used for the COVID-19 pandemic, such as the travel restrictions, quarantine have created several uh, difficulties for the hotel industry. The restrictions have had a uh, negative economic impact on the travel sector worldwide. It started with the increase of cancellation of hotel and travel reservation. But during COVID-19, many hotels and lodges, transport systems, local shops were, were completely shut down. Therefore, the, therefore the, their staffs are, they retrain their staffs and, or reduce their salary. Staffs of many hotels and lodges are un, unemployed during this pandemic due to six to seven months. Uh, their family faces economic problems. Some of them started new work during this pandemic for living. Uh, this is my study area, New Diga. Uh, <coughs> New Diga is an important tourist center of Purvanipur district in West Bengal. New Diga is an ideal destination for the refreshing break from the cities. It offers a complete holiday experience. Uh, objectives. In this coastal area, hotel industries and ancillary businesses are mainly focused. Following objectives are how the tourism industry was operated during the COVID situation, how much employment and second is how much employment negotiated was uh, done during COVID situation and third is how ancillary businesses was operated during COVID situation and the last is to find if any protocol or coping strategy started. The method this study is largely descriptive and interpretative. That's why the measures, uh, majority of the methods uh, will qualitative and also some quantitative methods are used for analysis. And I also used observation, participant observation, uh, schedule sensors, uh, mapping, interview, there are the structure and unstructured questions are present. And the case study methods and techniques to collect the data. And the findings. Occupational shift is occurred in every hotel. Staffs, staffs are unemployed during lockdown. After lockdown to lead a better life, they work many kinds of work which are not same to their previous work. Mostly of them work in that time like vendors of green vegetables, vendors of cheese. Some of them to do daily work in their own village. During lockdown, their main income source or stock. So they use their lifetime savings for lead a better life in the in that time. During lockdown, many strategies were taken for the preventing the spread of COVID-19, like give hand sanitizer mask everywhere in New Delhi, open more quarantine centers. And main problem of tourism is book rate system. Brokers are charged 30 to 40 percent uh, on every room rent, uh, which is coming down the 20 to 30 percent in pandemic situation. In this situation, when less tourists are coming, uh, bring them to the uh, hotel and ask for their percentage. Uh, if hotel owners and manager did not give their percentage uh, of book rates, uh, then they play a dramatic role to spread false news. 
and to attract the tourists after lockdown they uh, give 20 to 30 percent off in a uh, room rent and also give hand, hand sanitizer mask etc hotel manager also took negative report of covid uh, covid 19 from tourists they maintain the hygiene of the rooms and their kitchen and staff as well as and had the some pictures of new regard before lockdown during lockdown and the after lockdown uh, uh, in my in my opinion people who are associated with the tourism uh, need to take this opportunity to improve the clean uh, cleanness and hygiene of the area with the help of local administration and the state government. In this region, are required to protect the measures to promote the tourist places to local people or in the same region and make them aware about the importance of their visit to this place. Uh, the state government has a very important role along with the local tourism bodies to promote the local tourist attraction uh, to the people of this region with a view to uh, make local or religious uh, people as case holder of this industry. And the thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maithi. Uh, very lucid presentation and as you are a MPhil scholar and uh, the research uh, prospect uh, is also very good with you. And uh, now, dear participants, uh, I am thankful to you for uh, present in this uh, session. Uh, I think uh, it is very enjoyable and very noble uh, session. Uh, in the uh, first, uh, we can get the from the historical perspective and the bridge uh, between anthropology and literature and from the Shakespeare's point of view and we also find our journey to the plague situation and cholera situation like different epidemic situation. And where God's role to help us, uh, he also discussed and uh, now uh, we have two contemporary health uh, care situation of Boiga and Loha by two uh, noble scholars. And they also uh, depict their ethnomedicinal uses of the Boiga communities and also the health care scenarios of Loha. Uh, during this pandemic, we can also uh, explore their uh, current situation and problem prospect of Indian tribal situation also. And uh, last, uh, we can get the scholars from the University of Delhi uh, that the uh, communication, behavioral communication is a good strategy for combating the mental health problems in COVID-19 situation. Inter and inter-family communication uh, is very important and we also are careful to combat the health problem through his, her ideas. And now uh, this is the prospect of tourism and uh, in COVID-19 situation, the tourism sector also facing and uh, very much a uh, problem. Uh, of uh, different problem which uh, could not arise in before. So uh, these sessions, I uh, request participants uh, to connect with these scholars uh, from through the organizer for uh, get uh, better research outcomes and uh, let us come connect with our academia. Thank you to all and especially thanks to our organizers. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Dr. Shudhi Bhui. Uh, for uh, very nicely conducting this session and uh, very nicely, uh, smartly briefing this session. Uh, thank you again, sir. And now uh, I would uh, uh, like to request Dr. Shomit Kumar Maithi, uh, Assistant Professor and HOD of Department of English and Coordinator of IQSC of Shivavarti Mahavidala to give a vote of thanks. Uh, please. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Alexan Borman. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Oh. Uh, yes, sir, evening. you are audible. Good evening, everybody. Uh, myself, Dr. Swamit Kumar Maithi, Assistant Professor, Department of English, and also the IQSC Coordinator of Seva Bharati Mahavidyala. On behalf of IQSC Seva Bharati Mahavidyala, uh, I extend my hearty thanks to the organizers of this three-day international webinar on anthropology of epidemics organized by Department of Anthropology and IQSC, Seba Bharat Mahavidyala, Kapgadi, Jhargram, West Bengal, in collaboration with Department of Anthropology, Sukumar Sengupta Mahavidyala, ESPU, Postsim Medipur, West Bengal, India.
uh, first of all i'd like to extend my hearty thanks to the chairman of this three days international webinar uh, professor dr devu prasad sahu principal seva bharati mahavidyalaya and um, another chairperson of this webinar professor dr deepak kumar bhuya principal sukumar sen gupta mahavidyalaya for their kind support and motivation my special thanks goes to the chairperson of the first session of the second day of this 3 days 3 uh, days international webinar professor subir bissas professor department of anthropology west bengal uh, west bengal state university west bengal and i also uh, extend my hearty thanks to the invited speakers uh, professor arup ratan bandopadhyay professor department of anthropology university of calcutta west bengal and mohammad golam hosen professor department of statistics rajshahi university bangladesh my sincere thanks goes to the second chairperson of the second session of uh, the second uh, day of this international webinar i mean dr jyoti ratan ghosh associate professor department of anthropology vishwavarati university uh, i also extend my sincere thanks to dr sudip bhui associate professor department of anthropology and tribal studies sidhu kanubir sen university west bengal the chairperson of the session 3 of the second day of this 3 days international webinar on uh, anthropology of epidemics i also uh, convey my hearty thanks to the organizing secretary and convener mrs ruby adok ponda faculty and hod department of anthropology seva bharat mahavidyalaya and joint secretary dr santunu ponda faculty and researcher department of anthropology sukumar sen gupta mahavidyalaya for organizing this three days international webinar particularly during this time when the academic activities are suffering a lot due to Uh, pandemic situation my sincere thanks goes to each and every paper presenter who participated their uh, well conducted research works and who who presented their well conducted research papers in this webinar and shared their thoughts and ideas with the participants and uh, i also express my thanks to the participants to the students to the Uh, researcher academics academicians and delegates from uh, various universities and various academic institutes uh, from from uh, from country from the country as well as from abroad so uh, with this i i conclude my sincere thanks goes to everybody who has who has collectively made this web 3 days webinar a successful one so this is the second day and we will meet tomorrow uh again for the validated session and for the last day uh, seminar webinar so with this over to you dr alok sen varma uh, thank you very much uh, dr Sh- uh, sumit kumar maiti sir uh, for giving the uh, vote of thanks uh, now we have come to the end of this uh, sessions uh, and uh, the day uh, second day of the webinar uh, on the anthropology of epidemics Uh, which is uh, organized by the department of anthropology and iqac of shivabharti mahavidyalaya uh, in collaboration with the department of anthropology shukumar sen gupta mahavidyalaya keshpur uh, i like to uh, uh, sh- uh, end this uh, session uh, with a speech of the marshal sharlings uh, we can reproduce within our own minds the way that the world is put together for other people this is the extraordinary privilege and adventure of anthropology thank you very much thank you all uh, tomorrow we have the three sessions uh, which will be uh, uh, there will be the two invited uh, speech uh, speaker one is professor adil hasan choudhury and professor pinak tarabdat and there are uh, two another sessions uh, in the session two there will be the six paper presenters and in the last session there will be the five paper presenters welcome all of you and 
i heartily welcome all of you uh, for tomorrow uh, 3 pm please join with us thank you for your patience thank you all thank you all dr alokshan borbon for your painstaking presence since beginning to end thank you again dr alokshan borbon thank you sir thank you sir भारत लक्ष्य थैंक यू बोले